We are not ready to begin right now. One second. Hey, but I'm about to start the meeting. I'll call you after the meeting's done, okay? Oh. Okay, I'll, um, um, it, that's, I understand. Okay. I, um, yeah, I, I need to go see what this is about. He is, uh, this is, he's saying it's an emergency. Okay. So, my apologies. I will try to make it back. Thank you. That's cool. Those are awesome. I got it. I, I was just trying to send the uh, link to Council Member Ball. I like this. We can go to dinner. And OK, uh, well, with that, uh, it's six o'clock. We will bring this meeting or workshop to order. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Mayor McCullough. Deputy Mayor Carter. I'm here. Council Member Baldwin. Council Member Fullerton. Here. Council Member Hubler. Here. Council Member McClymans. Here. Council Member Roach. Here. Council Member Swatman. Present. Thank you. I think uh, Council Member Baldwin is trying to get on uh, online there. I sent her the link, so she should be soon. Uh, so next we have a presentation from Interim Public Services Director Jason Sullivan. I'll hand the floor over to you, sir. So uh, as, as this is just a presentation, we're not requesting any council action or direction. Um, we just wanted to kind of get back with the council that we have a few new council members and kind of go back over kind of what the process it takes to go from MOU to actual construction um, of the read property uh, with MRAC and kind of what are the critical path items that have to be accomplished in order to get to that point so that there's a kind of an understanding of what those steps are and, and how they work. So just kind of some background. Um, as, as we've noted, we bought the property in, in 2010. Uh, in 2012, we did some exploratory drilling to see if it could be used as a water resource well. Uh, it did not have enough capacity to support a municipal drinking water source. Um, so then in 2019, the property was declared surplus by the city council, uh, which means that there was no municipal purpose for the property. Uh, in 2023, we were a, approached by MRAC and MRFC to requesting that we enter into agreement with the property for multi-sports fields and to add a lease to the city property. Uh, in June of that year, it was slightly changed and a new resolution was passed uh, directing the, the, well, the council, oh, sorry, in June, the council passed a resolution directing us to negotiate an agreement with MRAC and MRFC uh, related to that property. In September, the city entered into a memorandum of understanding, uh, which expires in August of this year. Memorandum of understanding isn't a lease. It doesn't bind the city. It is simply a document that outlines general responsibilities to move toward an ultimate goal. In this case, it would be the lease and development of the property, but it's not a binding agreement or a lease document. It only sets out a terms of how we're going to work together to achieve an objective. So what we what we try to do is identify what we call the MOU critical path. So taking the things that are in the MOU that have to be accomplished to get us from day one to construction, what do those things look like and how do they all work together? So the first was the PTRO plan. Uh, there was an agreement in the MOU in section two in, in section two one B that basically we would add the read property of the city's parks, trails, and open space plan. Um, to date, the draft uh, PTRO plan does identify the REED property as a future park. Uh, the council also requested that we note we're working with MRAC to develop the REED property. Um, we have made 
changes to some of the narratives to reference that we are having agreement with M with MRAC to develop the property. Um, currently, council action on the PTR plan is targeted uh, um, for May 4th. That may slide as we finalize the document because we still have to do a 60 day commerce review. We still have to complete SEPA and we still have to finalize the document. So there's some there's some just things that we're working through that have to get done and they just there's some timelines there. Um, and we're hoping that sometime in May, um, late May possibly, of having that PTRO plan in front of the city council for uh, final consideration. We also have to do a public hearing with the planning commission. Can you just define PTRO for me? Parks, trails, recreation, and open space plan. Thank you. Yes, and stop me if you have questions. So that that is well underway and the city's meeting its obligations under the MOU um, to do what we had said we would do. Uh, the property transfer is the next kind of critical path item. Um, which was discussed in section 2.1a of the MOU, which said that the city would would uh, bring forward a consideration to transfer the ownership of the property from the water utility to the general fund. Um, as part of the MOU, we agreed to get an updated appraisal, which city administration has done. Um, the one of the one of the big items that's left is the council still needs to take action to authorize the transfer of the funds from the general fund to the water utility. Uh, and under RCW 4309210 sub 3, we are required to transfer the basically what they consider the fair market value for the use of that property um, from the general fund to the water fund. Um, that transfer can occur at any time, um, but the city council may want to consider making that transfer with the adoption of the 2526 budget to better understand the budgetary impacts, because that will be funds that the city is expending that could. And that would just be a budgetary uh, question the council would want to consider, but they could do it at any time. It's just bringing forth the resolution um, because it deals with real property and discussions more about that would have to occur in an executive session. Um, so if that's something the council would like us to set up, we can work with the city attorney and the city clerks to set up that executive session. So this is where the where really becomes. Uh, kind of shifts back to MRAC. Um, before we can take a lot more actions um, that the city has agreed to. Um, in order to kind of take the next steps after the property transfer, because if we transfer the property and we don't do the deal, we can always surplus it and the general fund gets paid back from the surplus of you know, it the second time. It really MRAC needs to submit um, their site plan. All of the other work items are contingent on getting that site plan submitted to the city. So the next step would be negotiating a lease. Um, Section 2.1F uh, discusses negotiating a long-term ground lease, um, which contains adequate public benefit that is equal or greater to the fair value market of the rent of the property. And this is also discussed in Section 7 of the MOU uh, in the long-term ground lease. It specifically says that it needs to have a site plan, which is why negotiating the ground lease is dependent on getting the site plan submitted. There's also requirements for performance bonds insurance and indemnification, uh, performance measures that MRAC will have to meet, and also rent to include a payment of a leasehold tax. There's the possibility that a lease can be low, um, but we have to demonstrate that the discount between the market value of that lease to what we actually charge in lease, there's a corresponding public benefit to the public that the pub general public is getting to enjoy outside of MRAC's soccer and their their programs that there's a, just a general that you don't have to be participating in interact events to have access to those things like we do with our our park facilities and depending on how much that is open or not open will determine how much that lease can be discounted the leasehold tax is based on the actual developed property so whatever the value of that developed property is that's what the leasehold tax will be so there's two things there's the lease leasehold tax. We cannot waive the leasehold tax. So that will be part of the agreement. Those are all things that have to be in the long term lease that we haven't started working on um, because we haven't got the site plan back from MRAC. What would a leasehold tax entail cost wise? What it's, would it's, that be? It's basically like a property tax. OK. Uh, oh, see, now you have the bad. You got the bad mic tonight. So. Is something that the state um, law passes so that when government property is used for other than governmental purposes, because they don't take property tax 
off of governmental property. So when governmental property is used by others for non-governmental purposes, there's a 12.84% leasehold tax that has to be based on the fair market value of the rent as developed, as Jason said. So that's something that um, would be paid to the, to the state at any you know, in any case. So we'd want to make sure in any time you have a lease, unless there's an exemption and there are some, that the tenant is the one paying the leasehold tax. So just to... <laughs> I want to get rid of Just to make sure there was part of that that I didn't fully capture. Um, so it's a 12.84% leasehold tax. That's the fair market value of the rent or of the value of the land. We'll try this. It's based on the fair market value of the lease. So if you rented it on an open market, for, you know, without it being a discounted rate, that is what the 12.8% is based on. So if, if the fair market value of a of the use of a piece of property is $2,000 a month and you're renting it for 200, the leasehold tax is based on the $2,000. But is it? And, and we have the rental value under the appraisal. Okay. Um. Is that, um, oh man, I just lost my train of thought there. So if, if they have a 12.84% leasehold tax market value, is that just on the undeveloped land that we are leasing to them? Or is it now on the developed land once it's leased to them? It would be based on the developed land because it's the fair market value of what that land would be. Even though they're for. the ones that are going to put the money into the land. Correct. Because that's the fair market value of what it would be leased for. When it's undeveloped, it would be based on the undeveloped. When it's developed, it would be based on the developed. If that makes sense. Jason, I had a question. On the, you'd said the, the actual lease can be artificially low, assuming there's a public benefit. How do you calculate the public benefit? Is it half that, the that's property? That's that we're going to have to work through on the negotiation side as we see kind of what's getting developed and what kind of access we have, um, there's not a mathematical calculation or a formula that I can point you to. Um, it's it's one of those things I think for, it's council member Swatman's, it has to pass the smell test right. um, <laughs> type of analysis. Like we can't, we can't say, oh, a pub, the public gets to walk on there once a month. <laughs> and that is equal to completely removing all the least, the least value. Right. So it's gonna be dependent on, a, how much the pro and Jennifer, you can jump in, but how much how much they build on there, and then how limited access or how much access the public has, and it could also be I think Jennifer and I talked if Fine Lake residents get a significant discount on joining MRAC's programs, right? So there's it could be all sorts of things. It could be um, having a playground developed on a part of the property that's open during you know from dawn to dusk park hours for the general public. It could be um, discounted um, uh, fees for people of low income who are Bonnie Lake residents. It could be discounted fees for Bonnie Lake residents. It could be um, developing, um, allowing use of, if there's, you know, buildings, allowing some programming use by the park system so many hours per day, um, you know, day in, day out, with maybe some exceptions when there's school breaks and maybe they have longer programs. So there's all different ways you can structure it, but the public has to get a benefit from it if we're going to be not taking actual payment. In regards to the leasehold tax, uh, you, you mentioned there may be some things that uh, could be waived or whatnot, I'm not sure. What types of things could be waived? Deputy Mayor, I'm not sure I understand your question. The, the exemption. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know what? I am not an expert on this. I know that there is an exception for, I think it's for nonprofits with rent, low, low space. And I, we looked into it, for example, the um, food box outside the library, we did a license agreement. The city did a license agreement to allow the food bank to go on there. They didn't have to pay the fair market value of leasehold tax because they had an exemption. So there was an exemption for that, but Generally, people pay the leasehold tax. The city remits it to the state, and that is, I'd have to look it up. I'm sorry. That's okay. And and we wouldn't want to move to the annexation step until the long-term lease is 
done and signed or nearing completion. Um, because if we don't come to a term on the lease, we're really not going to want to annex that property into the city. Um, because outside of the MRAC uh, proposal, we would just leave it for surplus and allow another purchaser to purchase the property. So kind of that's why we call this the critical path, right? So steps one and two, we can kind of do whenever the council wants us to do and we're working on after the after that red line, that's zero day. So it's hard to say how long steps one, two, and the next three steps are going to take because we haven't got to zero day, which is the submittal of the site plan that we all agree to as a site plan for the property. So you have the negotiation of the lease. That's going to take some time. Those, those things are never hammered out in 30 seconds. It's a, it's a, it's a, I think they're looking for a 50 year lease on the property. So you have to think about every contingency that could happen over the next 50 years. What happens when MRAC dissolves? What happens if they don't want to use the facility anymore, you know, you know, there's lots of things that have to be thought of. And so those ground leases can take some time. So once that ground lease is done or we're to the point of we're working out like minor final details, we could then begin bringing forward the annexation process. Um, we do have to have the transfer of funds completed before we can even start talking about annexation. And the reason is, is the RCW that we're using for the annexation 35A14300 is we are annexing property for municipal purposes. Right now we have a resolution saying the property is not needed for municipal purposes. So we can't turn around and annex it for municipal purposes until the general fund has acquired that property and said it will be used for park purposes. Um, then once we boot bring it in, um, the, we do have to turn, provide notice to the boundary review board once the council adopts the annexation process and there's a 180 day notice. So from day one that I send that notice to the boundary review board, we can't actually annex the property for 180 days, which is about six months. So if we were to do, if we were, if we were this step today, the soonest we could annex that property would be the end of August. Um, that's not assuming that we don't have any BRB review or BRB challenges. Um, so I, I will say the annexation that we're undertaking is in the gray area of annexations. And if you talk to people, you'll get different opinions. So the RCW 35A14, it talks about municipal code annexation or code city annexations does include a provision in a separate RCW that says you can't annex, you can't, you cannot annex property outside your urban growth area. This area is outside of our urban growth area. However, 35A14300 says a city can annex its own property. Um, the city's position has historically been, and we have done this historically, is that as an, as, an, as an exemption to the general provision because we are not adding capacity to the urban growth area by annexing our own properties because we don't provide, we're not included in that kind of discussion of capacity. That's been our historical standpoint. I'm not going to say that that has been the universal standpoint. That's why I call it a gray area. Um, so, why couldn't we just go ahead and annex the property after we transfer the funds? Because can't it be put back into surplus that the city owns? Even if, even if you know, say MRAC doesn't, we don't have a negotiation and we don't have a lease with them, then we've annexed the property. Does that mean that we can't do something with it because it's been annexed? We would not be able to declare it surplus to governmental needs because we said we just annexed it for governmental needs. Okay. And so you couldn't annex it and sell it for someone to do residential development because that would be a violation. Okay. Um, so that's why we're saying the ground lease, the property transfer, those are kind of prerequisite steps. We're not saying that the land, the lease has to be fully signed everything done, but we need to be well into that process before we even start the annexation discussion so that we know we're getting there because there's going to be issues about insurance and indemnification and how long are you going to have to build out the project? What are the milestones? What are the bonding requirements? So you're going to want to be well into that conversation. You do have that 180 day window. So, you know, if you're well into that conversation, you could start that 180 day window. Um, you just wouldn't take the final steps of annexing it if something fell through. That's a timing game. Because at this point, the the MOU is expiring in August, and now you're saying that if we started today, then the annexation would happen 
possibly by August. So we're kind of getting into yeah, so the council has the timeline issue. Yeah, the council has the option of extending the MOU. Um, we didn't anticipate that we would not have a site plan from MRAC by now. Um, we've been waiting for about five September of last year. So, you know, if we would have I'll interject on that. That's not their fault though. That that's it, that's a both sides fault. No, I'm just saying that city and MRAC. I'm just saying that 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 line mm -hmm. that we it's haven't just been there's not been any well, and I have some questions on that too. How, how could you say that though? I don't I completely don't understand that. Because the city hasn't given them the ability to get onto the property to figure out what like legally they can do. I, right. But again, I would differ a little bit, right? Nope. Because I don't see why they have to have access to the property to have a really to do their property. survey so though. If if you wanted to buy a house, do you have the legal obligation to go on and do a feasibility study to find out it. if you don't want to buy it. it. Don't need you it. You don't? Nope. Okay. So you're going to go in blind yep. and purchase. Not blind. You're going in blind though. Not blind. This property is blind? a blind piece of property no, for not. MRAC and I got the city. satellite. I got the topography. I got all the traffic stuff. I got everything I need to do a plan for that property. I don't know what else I need. All I need to know not is some of the Tribal land. Do you know what the tribal land is? Yeah, it's delineated. But do you know what's on the tribal land? Do you know you what's you under the land? Go, you have to go do site digs. So right? they need a feasibility study. They right. need to be able to feasibly go in and look at that land and know whether they can actually do something. Because yes. why waste our time on a right. lease agreement right. exactly. if they don't know if they can do the actual work? Right. That's all they need to right. do. Right. And our only point was that they're so far from any kind of a idea, though. It's That's what I don't understand about the whole deal. That's you know, actually not all, true. All's, all's I hear, what do you mean? It's not true. I they've hear showed us plans. Real, they've showed us plans? Yeah, they showed us some. So why hasn't the city said, oh, that's a good plan and approved it? Because it was their presentation to us a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago? Mm -hmm. The presentation that MRIC yeah, stood sure. here and gave us? The, and Pierce County and everybody, the tribes and everybody signed off on this plan. Oh, that's what I told you. Is they gave us a presentation. This is their presentation right. of, hey, these are things we're thinking of that could happen. But, but I hear millions of dollars worth of like impediments to them using this land, right? Where's millions of dollars coming in? Impediments. All of these improvements that they need to do, all of the traffic studies they need to do, all of the offsite, onsite improvements to be able to use the land. The first thing they're asking for is basically to be able to go onto the land to look at it with general contractors and say, yes, we can do this or no, we can't do this. And then they can bring forward the plan that they have been working on before it's presenting and finalizing and spending thousands and thousands of dollars on something. They need to be able to know they can go on the land first. We'll look at it. Tell us whether they can or cannot use it. Now. I'd walked in the middle of it. I don't know where it started and everything, but it is, is sounding like this particular conversation, though very, very relevant, should be happening in a committee meeting as opposed to our. Um, well, there there has show. been, though, and that's what I don't understand, Mr. Mayor, is there has been meetings with, you know, all of the individuals involved in this. And I, I don't know if the council's got fully informed of what all the issues are. So, and, and as I said, we were just bringing, we only mentioned the site plan because it, it's the it's the zero line in which all the t other timelines start to work, right? Okay. So everybody's asking us, how long does it take to get to construction? We're just mentioning, for whatever reason, for the point of this pre presentation, we're just saying the site plan is kind of the day zero mark. Once the site plan comes in, and I think there's a discussion later about some of the other issues, then we can get to that. Um, we were mainly wanting to also let the, the council know that if we do go to BRB, there is a there is a chance the BRB has the, the authority to deny the annexation. So even if we approve it, the BRB could say no. The people who invoke the BRB's jurisdiction um, right now, there are two of the five members or only two of the five positions are staffed. So we do not think that the BRB itself, because it takes three, can invoke their own jurisdiction. I, I only know BRB is be right back. If you um, uh, Boundary Review Board. Board. Thank you. They are, they are a jurisdictional agency that has authority over annexations. I don't okay. think they've ever approved anything for us, right? <laughs> uh, some things. 
<laughs> the county can also invoke the BRB's jurisdiction. So regardless of how many members it has, the county could say, we're impacted, we don't agree with this annexation, and because of the gray area of it, want to have BRB make a decision. That could have an impact. We're just laying it out as a as something that could impact us moving forward. What happens if the BRB says no and we cannot annex it? Then the go above their heads to Pierce County. <laughs> they would have to then sue all their permitting through Pierce County. Okay. We could still lease it to them. Okay. We could still do all that, but they would have to do all of their permitting through Pierce County, and we would probably have to tweak the lease because the lease is going to talk about how we would do our permitting role versus our ownership role. Uh, but in that case, we would not be the owner. And then they would have to deal with the county on whether it's a permitted use. If you could go back a little bit more on the annexation part of it, and perhaps um, Ms. Robertson or Council Member Roach can enlighten us on how how the county can overrule what a, a city wants to annex. So the BRB is a creation of the state government. Um, and it allows for what they call uh, the Boundary Review Board. They are specifically empowered for reviewing all types of annexations. So annexations of cities, annexations of water districts, combinations of water districts, fire districts, when they go to merge and when they go to change. So the BRB is a state empowered. So they're kind of outside the county, but the county acts as their kind of liaison and provides the administrative support. The members of the BRB are appointed by a number of different agencies. So two of the member, two of the members are appointed by the governor. One member is appointed by special utility districts, water districts. Uh, one member is appointed by the county itself. And then one member is appointed by the mayors of the cities and towns. Right now, only one of the governor positions is appointed and only one of the um, the special utility district position is appointed. The other positions are vacant. Okay, now I understand about uh, the personnel. What I'm wanting to know again is the procedure. So we would. What is it that? Uh, how how does that work? So we we make notice. We make notice to the BRB that we want to annex this property. That notice has to be provided to the BRB 180 days before the annexation is official. Okay. <clears throat> Within. 15 days of receiving that, the clerk of the BRB, which is Pierce County staff, they serve as the clerks to help do the administration of the BRB, by that notice to the board members of the BRB and affected agencies, so the county in this case. Um, within 45 days of receiving that notice, the BRB can invoke their jurisdiction to review the annexation, um, and then, or the county can say they want the BRB to review that annexation. And it, it, if they exceed that 40, Five day parameter, does it stop and the um, land, the property is annexed by default? No, we still have to wait the 180 days, but we know that there's not going to be our BRB review. Okay. We have, we have about 60 day window where we're waiting to hear about a BRB review. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> and then Council Member Fullerton. I did. <laughs> She's on her phone. Wait, while she's getting in, I would say the RCW that gives them the authority is 3693-100. Um, it gives the BRB specific authority to approve, deny, or modify an annexation request. Okay. Appreciate that. Well, while we're waiting, Council Member Fulton, I'm on. Okay. Um, so, my, I, I believe that what Council Member Hubler and I were um thinking during the whole presentation from MRIC was the inability for them to because they're not leasing the land yet they don't have a lease agreement they were having issues getting the two million dollars in insurance that they needed to get onto the property to do their feasibility study that has to be done in order for them to make a plan. And so our concern, uh, pardon me, um, but I think that track. we're on the same page is um, that the concern anyway that I had was 
the fact that we're they will be hiring a construction company or a, a company that specifically professionally does studies. So why would they need a two million dollar insurance when if you're hiring a licensed and bonded company to come onto your not even your property because you're not leasing it yet, then why would their licensing and bonding not count towards that two million uh, in, in insurance because they're obviously covered and it's going to be one of their employees coming onto the property, walking around the property, figuring out where all the potholes and everything else are, what are all the loopholes that they're going to have to jump through. That's going to be a licensed and bonded employee from a survey company. So why would we require them to get $2 million in insurance? What I would... That's a that's a great conversation. I, what I would say is that's council member council discussion E tonight. Um, if you look at your agendas, um, item I'm sorry item D is risk liability policy, and that's that's that specific discussion about the insurance. So I would to keep this presentation moving down. and move it down and have that conversation with with item D. Then I think council member yeah Matt, council member requirements. I thought I saw your hand. Check in. In. Or is Councilmember Baldwin, can you be heard? Yes, I can hear you. Hey. hey. We hear you. Um, the question I have, first of all, thank you for clarifying BRB. Remember, we don't know all of these acronyms. So thanks for that question. Um, I am just curious with the BRB, is there a way for us to know maybe a little bit more ahead of 180 days of the possibility that they would do a denial of the annexation? That, as I was saying, that occurs within the first 60 days. So once we send the notice of the annexation to the BRB, that notice is then routed out to the members of the BRB within 15 days. And then they have 45 days from that date to invoke the jurisdiction of the BRB. So within 60 days. But the earliest days, you could know is the 180 days, right? You said that there's 180 days where you would be able to there's basically days. submit. Yeah. There's Before a, the a, annexation happens. Right. So there's there's two. So the 180 days, we have to provide notice 180 days before the, the annexation is effective. So that's just a statutory requirement. The annexation can occur 180 days after we provide notice to BRB. The invoking of BRB's authority to review the annexation occurs within approximately 60 days of us filing the notice. 15 days from the date that we give the notice to the BRB clerk, they distribute that to the BRB members and affected agencies. From that point, they have 45 days to invoke the jurisdiction of the BRB. If that's not invoked within 45 days, we know the BRB is not going to review the annexation, but we still have the 180 day clock, waiting clock that we have to wait for. So there's, there's two requirements. That's the 180 day clock that is just a statutory requirement, and then the 60-day time frame in which the BRB's in jurisdiction could be invoked. So within 60 days, we'll know whether or not BRB is going to be reviewing the annexation. Does that answer your council question, Councilmember Baldwin? Mr. Roach might know more input on that or something. I don't remember. Not exactly, remember but yeah. Can't yeah. So what, what was your question? That I, where am I missing? Well, I, in, first, in reality, that's a lot. I think in timeline, I'm just trying to figure out like when are they going to figure? When are we going to figure out that we there's we're potentially going to be hosed? Like when no, when is a realistic no. time period that people are going to go through a bunch of work and then we're going to have to go through an entirely different process if the uh, annexation doesn't pan out? I, I would say we would know. And as I'm saying, I can't give you a date from this date because we haven't passed zero line. That's what I was trying to say is that red line yeah. on the diagram is zero day. And that's the date we have the site plan. And now there's issues and I'm not trying to get into those issues. I'm just trying to as for a calendaring purpose, why I can't give you a date. I also don't know how long it will take to negotiate the ground lease. You're going to want to be substantially into the ground lease negotiations before you start the annexation process. You could do it simultaneously. Um, you could delay it by a couple months, but from the 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 site plan this the, the, there's two steps that we have to do before we can even annex 
this property? Well, one for sure, the other one is recommended. One, until the council transfers and purchases the property from the water fund, we can't submit an annexation for municipal purposes. Our recommendation is you don't transfer the funds and officially purchase the property until you're substantially through and understanding that the ground lease is going to work. So that's why the dates are a, hard, a little bit hard to nail down because there's just some risk built into this that we can't completely evolve in, out of the system. You could annex the property and we could start the annexation, um, but without the ground lease, as I said, you're not gonna wanna annex it because then you're kind of stuck with property you really can't surplus. Okay, uh, before we move forward, Councilmember Baldwin, do you have access to the screen uh, where you are now? Are you looking at the uh, uh, what we see as MOU critical path? I do, I okay, do. Good. Now, Councilmember mm -hmm. climb has been trying to um, uh, get in here. What do you? Yeah, um, I just wanna understand the value of annexation. If I'm correct, correct can, um, is the Tacoma Point water tank in the city of Bonnie Lake? Yes. Is it? It's in city limits. Yeah. Victor Falls, mm. um, the Public Works Center, Public Service Center, Lake Ridge. The Lake Ridge tank properties are in the city. Okay. The, uh, there's another booster pump property that's also annexed in the city. Um, they could do the project without the annexation. Mm. However. It's just another risk that runs into the wrinkle because all of the permitting authority runs then through Pierce County. Pierce County. Pierce County right. And whether or not Pierce County would permit a for profit company to build sports fields in a rural area, there was some discussion about that with the county count the county council at our at a meeting. And we don't know. It's just a risk. So yes, they could if the annexation got completely denied they could proceed with the project, but they would have to do all the permitting with the county yeah. under the rural five zoning designation or rural 10 zoning designation. How long did that discussion happen? And do you know what the result was? There was no result. It was just a, it was just a conversation um, about, about whether or not if the property stayed in the county, could it be really? a permitted use? Okay. So with that also the permitting, because we're partners with Pierce County, of course, and even if we did annex it, aren't we going to have to, in, you know, interface with Pierce County with issues, or are we going to completely ignore Pierce County? No, we would still interface with Pierce County, but our development regulations would be the ones that would be supersede would super, would be the regulations for the property. So right. we would have its own public facility, which is, says parks are an outright permitted use. So that's an easier. Sure. to get to but yes we would stuff to interface with the county on traffic studies sepa um, because the access is in the county just like we had to with the p410 project the public works facility um, the annexation is not a end of the road issue it is it is a if it doesn't happen the permitting is done by the county yeah because that, that's a good point because i recall when we did the public services center that we had to satisfy some off-site requirements with pierce county to do that so and we had to do some there, there is some issues there we had to do some road improvements and some lowering of some grades on 96. When we does, did does you know because i again wasn't in that conversation mm -hmm. that apparently or maybe the deputy mayor was right were you the only one that was in that conversation with pierce county and a bunch of the other property Awesome. Council Member Roach and I and yeah. Know, so yeah. But what did you Council guys? Member Roach has a comment. Get, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get on the idea of because I, I completely don't understand why there's there's so many issues with that piece of property. You know, I'd be just like giving it to them and having them have at it. You know, <laughs> as opposed to everybody trying to figure out all the issues, but because they have the WSU piece, they have that piece, and I don't know what other pieces they could be working with or at the same time or, or where all that conversation is. It just at the county or well, it all just the seems different players? To be that if they're trying to, you know, all these folks that want to build these fields or whatever they want to build, um, seems like there's a lot of impediments with this reed piece that are going to take a long time to work out. And, and you would think they would be, you know, working a bunch of different options because we got the parks and rec program that we're working with. It's an issue and, 
you know, I don't know how it all fits together. Yeah, it's uh, quite the puzzle piece. Um, I would say that there are several different options and things that people are looking at uh, currently and trying to figure out what is the best way to go. Uh, MRAC would rather have, I want to say it was 80, 80 years. 80 acres to do like what they would want to do. So 20 acres is, is not there, right? But yeah. it is, uh, it's better than nothing at this point. And so it was something to, hey, that could get us moving forward. Sure. Uh, but there were a lot of different conversations on a lot of different pieces of property. Um, well, yeah, I hope they can work in parallel or something. I hate to see everybody, you know, uh, putting all their eggs in one basket or something. Yeah, and I don't think that's occurring. I think they are looking around now. Councilmember Roach has a uh, question or comment. Yeah, the question was, and so, yeah, I think, you know, they are looking around, I think, especially with the food bank being interested as well. I mean, they're they're trying to work together where everyone's going to be a winner there. So they're looking at everything. But I would just, I mean, I, I know this one came up. I mean, they're obviously, they're looking, you know, cash flow stuff. So the pros are they're going to save capital. They don't have to spend a bunch of money on a piece of property. They potentially get a favorable lease if they could, you know, help the our city out. And then they'd have the the city in charge or the permitting. So those are all the the benefits of going down this road. But I'm looking at this road and I'm like, yeah, that's um, and and that's the why uncertainty and the delays and the hoops and even if everything goes super smooth, that's that's a lot. So I just wonder before we get too far down the road, if we had them in the in the you know the meeting just saying this is reality. Because they may look at that and say, you know what, it just makes sense. We'll just we'll just buy the property and deal with the county. And I will not say, have to go through all these hoops. I will say, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I apologize. Oh, um, I will say all of this is laid out specifically in the MOU, all of these steps. Mm -hmm. um, but because that MOU was done in September and there's been lots of talk and excitement, which I, I think is great. We That's why we wanted to come tonight and just kind of remind everybody of what the steps were and where the uncertainty lies. So we're not taking the position this isn't something the, count, the council should do or shouldn't do, just trying to say, here are some state law requirements that we're going to have to meet um, as we jump over certain hurdles. And as I said, you could annex the property, you could transfer the money now and annex the property now and get that done. But if the lease doesn't go through, then you're kind of right. stuck with this property that you really can't serve. Plus, unless we go through and try to de-annex the property. Yeah, right. I know it's all set out in the MOU, but I, I just wonder how much they actually understand that. Because three weeks ago, it was, we're going to be turning dirt here in three months. I'm like, of course. What? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's kind of, that. that was kind of the impetus for this presentation as I sat through that presentation. And I was hoping Doug or um, uh, Scott would be here tonight um, to have that. They're not. We can have that conversation with them. Um, but that's kind of what spurred this as I was looking at the the presentation and just going, there are some very big governmental hurdles that are outside of the city's control um, that we have to jump through. The Boundary Review Board one, I'm not saying anything's going to happen, but I would be remiss to say there's not a risk. Mm -hmm. right? I don't want to tell the council, yep, this is totally fine and totally good. And then somehow BRB invokes their jurisdiction and Everybody's looking at me going, Jason, why didn't you tell us this? You don't so want to it, sound like Doug? No, I, I, I want to be able to say this is this is a risk. We have done numerous annexations this way, but it's always a risk. Yeah. And so the, the, the things that have to happen before, the minimum thing that has to happen before we can start the annexation process is that property transfer, which is a council taking action to move the fair market value of that property from the general fund to the water utility. Once that do is done, we could start the annexation process. There's a risk on the city if the lease falls through or we can't get it done within that 180 day window. That is a policy decision and we'll move with whatever direction the council wants us to move in. Um, but then, then you're kind of setting that up until then. Um, negotiating the lease, that's why we were recommending you be somewhat into that lease um, before we start that 180 day clock and let us wrap up the lease. Mm -hmm. um, because that way, if we're if we're well into the lease negotiations and we start the 180 day clock, we can also we can repeal the ordinance before it takes effect. 
And before you can even secure the lease, they have to secure the $2 million insurance, which hasn't happened yet. Right. They would have to prepare the site plan, and it's held up on this insurance thing, which is that later discussion. Okay. Mr. McClyde. Oh, Deputy Mayor Carter. Oh, thank you. Uh, Doug would have been here, but he's out of the country. Um, Scott was in the last meeting with Pierce County, so he's starting to hear some of this. Um, but I would also yeah, recommend that you sit down and lay out a plan uh, for them as to what they're going to need to do to make sure that they are on board. Because I'm with Councilmember Roach here looking at this going, holy cow, like this is seems like a lot more than what maybe we heard to begin with. Um, OK, we can just do this, do this and, and move on. Right. And um, granted, I, I've never built anything, so I don't know how that process goes, but I don't think they've built anything in the city necessarily either. So I think we probably need to hold their hand a little bit getting through this process to see if this is worth even continuing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what, no count, yeah, we I will gladly email Doug and, and Scott and all um, with John and we can all get together and kind of walk them through these requirements. Um, that was why we wanted to do this presentation, just to kind of be transparent in what the, the state laws require of us um, and where the policy calls are. So they, well, when the annexation occurs, that's a policy call. When the negotiation, the lease, how fast that goes, you know, th those are just some policy decisions that the council will need to make. Well, for transparency's sake, where does Chris Lear fit into all of this? I know that he's been very enthusiastic behind the project. But... He he is just trying to bring the parties together and provide a neutral venue for meetings. Okay. So that you're not coming to the city hall or you're not going to Tarragon's office. That oh, it's a it's a neutral meeting place and trying to facilitate the conversation from a standpoint of neutrality. Would you concur, Councilmember Roach and Deputy Mayor Carter? I would, yeah. Thank well, you. well where, where are we on the agenda? I walked in a little uh, late myself. We're on the, a, the first We're still <laughs> presentation. Oh. <laughs> Why doesn't that surprise me? Yeah. So, and I don't know if I answered Councilmember Baldwin's questions, but since she's back in the room now, I thought I'd take another <laughs> run at it to see if I could fulfill going to be a really long um, time you did you did answer my question again it it is a bit like trudging through mud trying to yes. figure out exactly what it is that you are saying and i don't need another explanation i understand um but i think what we are trying to communicate is that it's it's just like the same complaints i've had before in regards to builders trying to come into bonnie lake where there isn't a clear enough, like there's people that are coming into the city that are attempting to build, for example. And there is so much that you have to attempt to like move through to be like, what is even the next step I'm supposed to do? And I, I've seen the MOU, but if if I were somebody that was going into something to build, um, I don't know that the MOU even is clear enough for me to know like what is the next step. For example, with the site plan, yes, you didn't receive it. And we can totally argue those points. And I heard what everybody said, and I think it's valid. However, like what are the what needs to be in the site plan exactly? Do they know that clearly? I'm sure you guys believe that they know. They don't seem to know. So so I've had several meetings with Doug Clevenger. Uh, most recently is December 15th. Uh, explained to him that the next step in the process, insurance requirements aside, is the development of a site plan that we could run through our pre-application process. So we have what's called a pre-application process where we sit down with a developer, in this case, MRAC, we get together with fire, building, engineering. Uh, you know, in this case, we'd send it out to Pierce County and have a sit down face to face meeting with all of those parties around the table, explaining to them exactly the steps that they need to get them to this end game of building these fields. Mm. Without that site plan, well, yes, they did do a diagram. We've received no engineering. You know, we've got nothing. Wait, so you're saying that you would sit down with all of the persons involved once a site plan yes. is put in. Yeah. Okay, but I guess I'm still, the question is not still not being answered, okay. is do they then know, they don't, they need the ticket. The ticket is they the site plan. Away with a multi-page letter that would say, building is gonna require you to do X, Y, and Z. Engineering is gonna require you to do A, B, and C. Pierce County is gonna require you to do a site. These are the fees that are gonna be involved. Hey, uh, Mr. Vodafich and, Ms. and Mr. Sullivan, Can you have that? we did discuss this in a um, the last presentation that they had a little more than a month ago. So. 
has there been any progress on that site plan? Text. Because I remember discussing the insufficiency of what they presented then. I can't speak as to what they've been doing internally, but I have not, we have not received the site. Plan. You, okay, that's. I think Councilmember Baldwin, to try to get to your, your answer. I think I'm gonna try one time, and if I if you shake your head, if I if I get too in the mud, I'm a detail person, so I apologize. No, I appreciate that. So, the the steps are that we to move forward to advance the ball down the court. There are things that we have to do, and things MRS East has to do. For us, the big one is the council taking action to purchase the property. That property is still owned by the water utility. It takes council action authorizing us to, yeah, to move it to the general fund. general fund yes. so that's that's step one the second step is the insurance issue aside is preparing a site plan once they have a site plan that would be enough then for jennifer to start negotiating the long-term ground lease and they have the laid out details of what needs to be included in the site plan they have that in their possession i would i would believe so um that's not an answer they, they don't seem like they need I, I, and i will i will gladly meet with doug and i think that needs to happen yeah I will. they don't seem to know what exactly is the expectation so, so what was in the uh the mou that, that we have given them and the access it's the same mou that was in the council agenda that we read before correct yes yeah okay i've read that whole document have a qualified professional prepare a detailed site plan for mrac it's proposed development of the Reed property. The site plan should include all improvements, including components, and be adequately detailed to permit the city to see all components of the project, including the construction details, and be suitable for permit application. Okay. The city shall have final authority to approve the design, construction, and plans documents. Okay. So have, you're saying have a well, have a qualified professional uh, prepare an archaeological and cultural resources report. Once the city has approved the site plan, uh, having a qualified professional prepare a detailed construction and estimate by, for completing the sports field project on the, on the Reed property, provide the city with detailed financial information to establish that MRAC has the financial ability to complete the construction project and operate the facilities, and then finally negotiate with the city for the creation of a long-term lease. Okay. So they have that in their hands. To the feasibility study. Yeah. Right, and, and that's why... And, and that's why I was trying to, because I think that we were trying to just lay out process and not so much, just so everybody understood the timelines. Okay. Now, who is the qualified who, professional thank you. in this case from MRAC's point of view? They're, they're typically civil engineering. Have they, do we know who that is? Have they we do not that? know who they have engaged as their civil engineering staff. Okay. They so they're asking us to transfer the money from the water fund into the general fund um, and do all that without, just on faith at this point. Well, we don't have any. Our deliverables in the MOU. Okay. Was one of the steps that we need to take. And that's number two for the second round. Yeah, we, we, we have got the appraisal. So we know what the fair market value of the land is. That transfer can occur whenever the council wants us to start taking that action. Do we have this on an, on a, a formal agenda at any time for us to take action on it? Uh, not yet, no. Okay. What is the fair market value yeah. of the land? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the fines. It's and then, uh, yeah. Oh. It's, yeah, so, you know, I, I kind of want to talk to the council here, right? I mean, it seems to me like, the policy that we're considering, the public policy that we're considering is whether or not to enable a public-private partnership to the benefit of the community to build a sports complex, we are unable to build on our own. So for me, it seems like that's a pretty short road to yes for me, right? We can't build a facility like that anytime soon. Uh, so we need help. We have help. So. If that's our policy, then we just need to very clearly direct that policy and then remove impediments that show up that are that are reasonable to remove, right? Without putting the city at too great a risk of some liability. Um, good news is we had a struggle session on liability with the insurance commissioner the other day. So we're all familiar with that. So um, for me, I want to see this work based on some of the principles that uh, Councilmember Roach said. Um, it, and uh, and so I think it's a good thing. Um, 
th that's where I'm at. And I, I think we need to ask and make a plan for the council to help get past all of these policy mm -hmm. roadblocks. What roadblocks? The, the liability that's on that's on I, item E would be one, right? The uh, the other one would be, I think we need part of our policy. I think we should make it clear to both sides here, uh, staff and MRAC of what a reasonable timeline is uh, for execution, because it's not fair to either side to have an indefinite timeline out there um, that, you know, uh, 15th of December was the last time that, you know, that's, that's two months ago. I mean, what, what, what's been going on for two months, right? So it, both sides have to work this actively and aggressively for it to work. Right. And I get the feeling that it's, it's a struggle for both sides at this time. I well, just don't, don't know how they're resourced, right? That's ultimate. That's my problem with it is they would, the site plan that we, you know, discussed earlier, right? And Mr. Sullivan, this might have been mentioned while I was out, but uh, what are you looking for for the council to do at, at this particular point? No, or is it I, simply an update? Yeah, this is, as we mentioned in the briefing, we were not looking for any action or policy decisions. Um, this was in response to just wanting to make sure the council understood the steps so that those policy rubs and policy directions that staff need to have mm -hmm. are discussed at the council level and that we receive kind of that that policy guidance. Um, it, it sounds like I think Councilmember McClymans was saying that the same thing as well. Um, so I think you know we can I can talk with city administration and get an exec session scheduled to talk about the purchase of the property because uh, that is one of those impediments that the council has to ultimately make right. the decision on, and we really can't talk about in open session. Um, but once that's done, um, then the policy question on the annexation. Um, becomes a policy call of how much risk tolerance the council wants to have of annexing that property before the lease is in place, before the site plan is in place. That is a pure policy discussion for the council. Um, and, and, then, and just for full clarity's sake, um, there hasn't been any what I would traditionally call progress from the MRAC since the last time we met. There hasn't been any steps that have been taken to move the site plan forward and for us to have a little bit more uh, clarity as far as... Um, it's it's all wrapped around this insurance <clears throat> okay, question. Yeah. So yeah. we provided them an access and use agreement back in September. Right. I specifically called out the insurance provisions in my email when I transferred it to them. Yeah. And since then, we've honestly just been waiting for them to sign the agreement. Granted, they can't get the insurance. Uh, and that's a discussion later later this afternoon. But um, okay. I think it was mid January when they got me the policy that we'll be talking about here later. Okay, Councilmember Roach has a. You know. I was going to say to the, I mean, right about mid January, maybe a little before, okay. is when there was the potential conflict with the food bank, and from that point, it became more of a conversation of how everyone can end up being a winner. And there's some meetings and things, but it wasn't necessarily dialed in on on this part because now it kind of was like, okay, what are we going to do? Are we looking for other potential areas? What does that look like? So that was part of the delay, I think, as well. Well, and the food bank would have to go through the same process, correct? It, it depends on what options they want. If the food bank were to just purchase the property, hmm. there would be the council of approval and acceptance of a purchase and sales agreement, and we would be done. I see. Um, MRAC has that same option. They could submit a proposal tomorrow to purchase the property from the city. The city could sell that property and an MRAC could proceed working with the county on those things. So that's still an option out there. Um, they could also do a full value lease with the water utility, right? So they could lease it from the water utility, but we wouldn't be able to give them the discount because the water, the water utility would not be receiving a benefit. I see. Um, so it, it just there's I, I think this one there it's complicated because there are so many different moving parts um, that it's hard to to give like those definite answers because it just depends on I don't know if you remember those if then books so you read if you choose this go to this page if you choose this go to that page that's what we're working our way through right now okay um, we have two questions uh, Councilmember Baldwin first since you're being pointed at. 
Mm-hmm. And this has been council member Hubert. Well, I heard the back and forth conversation between you two earlier. Um, and I guess my question is, um, so I'm talking to Scott um, right now. And um, if I'm understanding correctly, can you create a site plan with a qualified professional without accessing a site? Is that actually possible? No. Oh, I can do it. I'm just curious. Give me a check. I'll so then it. I have a, a second question then. I'm, you know, I'm a qualified professional would most likely want to go in and do soil testing. Yeah. Uh, one of those criteria that I read was an archaeological study, yeah, uh, study. getting on the property and digging yeah. out pits. Uh, could you do one off of aerial photography? Probably. That would be acceptable at, by, by the city. Okay. I guess the second part of my question then um, is, is there, since it sounds like insurance is again the barrier for them to be able to access a site, correct? To create a site plan with a qualified professional. Is that correct? So item E here. It's a barrier in that the insurance that they've, and again, we'll discuss this later, but the insurance package that they have submitted mm-hmm. does not meet the insurance requirements that were listed in the access and use agreement yeah. or the in the amounts that are being recommended by our insurance provider. Okay, so then is it possible for them to be able to access the site with a qualified professional with a staff member to then be able to collect things like soil samples, which are not hard to collect? Um, and all the other things to walk the property. Is that a possibility? That's the decision that we'll have later. I mean, do you want to expose the city to that liability? For them to walk on the property with, like, you, like, for example. It, it's more than just walking on the property. I mean, presumably, they're going to want to get in there. They're going to have a backhoe in there. They're going to be digging desk, test pits. They're going to be checking the house for asbestos. They're yeah. Be looking at the structural and engineering uh, of the existing buildings are there that they want to repurpose and use. It's much more than just walking the property. So quali- okay, I guess that's where I get confused. If, if it is that, if it is that, you know, level, um, then how can a qualified professional do it without accessing the site then? I guess that's, if they're just looking at topographical maps, like you were well, mentioning well, earlier. My My side comment is it's a magnitude thing that I'm like, wrestling with right yeah because i'm literally looking at say you know it's a five million dollar piece of property mm-hmm. well the development of that property from what i'm hearing is going to be a many times over five million dollars so if you have somebody arguing about this little tiny thing in a corner when there's no why are they even having a discussion if they're not prepared to spend 20 million dollars on the development Mm. You know, that's what I haven't heard. So it seems to be kind of a dead end to me. Okay, mm. uh, Ms. Robertson. So I was going to mention that um, they, and we can discuss this more at item D, but they, if they hired, say, for example, a Barkhausen or another big engineering firm, we could sign an access agreement with that person Bark. or with that organization, or that company, yeah. and they have lots of insurance. So if they, that's if they have so their main, we did. Has been. We, we, did. we don't know that. that. I'm literally talking to them right now. No, they didn't. They didn't give them that avenue because yes, that's did. what council member Hubler and I have been talking about when we're asking why can't a company that's licensed and bonded access the property. They could if they have an agreement with the city. We could give that company that's the, the license key. agreement. That's, that's the loophole. That's the key that we've been asking for. So you just literally opened up Pandora's box for us in a good way. Okay. So well, I think that we I think that staff has told um them that that they could that they could have instead their contractor, their professional be the person that signs the license. And that's the part practice. we're not privy to. Well, well I, I would prefer thinking of it as answering the question. Me, when <laughs> MRIC presented to us, when Doug stood here and presented, we asked if another professional could come on site and do that and have that access and it be their insurance. And you guys told us no, that MRAC had to have the insurance. I don't. I don't remember that exactly. I think I said we'd have. They ha- whoever it is has to have an agreement with the city. So if if their prof- if their organization that they're using would want to sign the agreement with the city, that's fine with me. We just need to know whoever's going on there. Someone has to be on the hook with the city. 
So, and we can talk about this more at item D if you, if you. Yeah, like. in fact, let's. Um, I think yeah. we've. We're, we, yeah, we're. Yeah, I just want to. just want to wrap up. So we're good. All right. Um, I, I believe that in that instance, the discussion that night was with that MRIC would put up their part of the insurance, and if they could get their whoever their qualified engineer to put up the additional, and that doesn't fulfill the requirement. MRAC could certainly go and get an umbrella policy, which is also what uh, WCIA recommended. And umbrella policies are, are generally speaking much easier to get because it's it comes into play after the primary policy takes place. So um, it would be a million dollar umbrella policy, not a two or three million dollars. So it would be what their, their current insurance carrier says that they could get and then they could shop for a $1 million umbrella policy. That was mentioned that night. I have, I don't think anyone has heard whether they've looked through that avenue or not, but a cursory search today and looking for corporate umbrella policies for a million dollars, they're not super expensive. I don't know what MRAC's finances are. That, that's, you know, that's not the city's business to get into those kind of weeds to be able to help out. Um, but it would be just a $1 million umbrella policy. It was a 2 million. It's a 2 million aggregate. So their, their policy that, that they're saying they can get is already $1 million. So another $1 million umbrella policy would make it the $2 million per occurrence. And the, the, the risk to the city is worst case scenario, let's say they have an engineer going out on site and the barn falls down and there's a catastrophic accident. The city doesn't want to be the, the last one at that dance. We do not want to be liable for those types of possibilities. And that's why the city does require those levels of insurance. Or it could simply be twisting an ankle in a pothole that you don't see. And it doesn't matter how qualified you are, that could uh, instigate uh, a breach of duty from the city. So uh, Council Member Baldwin. Um, I do remember that as far as like the umbrella policy and just the combining of the two um, possibilities. I think our, our frustration is just being able to hear the really clear like pathways so that there's a little bit more choice. So like, for example, um, you know, you guys just mentioned that technically the umbrella policy and the additional $1 million is not actually required for the qualified professional to access the site if they signed a site agreement, if it was somebody that already carried their own insurance. Is that correct? Am I hearing that right? They would have to have those insurance limits and they would have to est establish to the city that they have those insurance limits. Yeah, the, the actual qualified professional. If the person, yeah, if they're yeah. signing the agreement with the right. city and they have those insurance, great. Yeah, so I think like it, it with somebody who is not experienced in the building of things, like it, it is nice to know that like there are these clear paths. Like, okay, here's the one that you just mentioned. Here's option one. Okay, option two is you personally don't have you know the one and plus the additional one million policy. However, if you found a qualified professional that had this level of insurance coverage. Um, then they would then sign a site agreement and then could access the site and do the site study. I feel like that that has been a little bit like mud. We haven't felt like that's that part. Yes, the insurance with the additional need for, you know, another one million dollars. That that part has been very clear. Well, uh, I, and pardon me for for getting into that, but I, I can tell you that um, um, it liability is a lot more complex than what uh, you know people think and i can tell you that it doesn't matter what agreement has uh, come in they cannot completely absolve the city from from liability if anything major happens and i can pretty much from my experience pretty much tell you that they would be going after the city in their deep pockets if if something did uh, unfortunately occur you just can't sign an agreement and absolve yourself completely of or or waive that even if they do have insurance the but a, repu a yeah. reputable company that would be coming on for example you know that that would be doing this the help with the site plan um, and I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Like anybody can sue anybody at any time. Right. Um, which is a bit unfortunate, but, um, you know, I just, yeah. Yeah. Well, have we kind of officially or unofficially moved to item D? I mean, we've been just, talking about it for just, the last day. No, we haven't even mentioned it. Yeah, I just wanted to wrap this. We will let Jason wrap yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. I just want to wrap this up. Sorry, Jason. We've been very, very I'm trying to do this so that we do break through these 
murky barrier so that everybody has an understanding of the things that we have to do. Mm -hmm. Once it's annexed, then we can do the permitting. That permitting is going to require SEPA, engineering, stormwater. One of the things that I did not see on that site plan was where their stormwater was going to go. Um, that's a big space taker. Um, unless they're doing vaults, which are vaults are expensive. So that was one thing I noticed with the site plan where that stormwater would go. Qualified professional understands that they would work on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. If they had somebody hired, they would know. Yes. All the eyes to dot. Yeah. These are all very standard requirements. Um, the the stormwater manual, the grade and fill permit, clearing, building permit, site plan review. Those are all the permits that we would have to to go through. The speed at which we go through those things um, really just depends on the quality of the submittal. Yeah. Um, Chris has got great engineers for his projects, and we are flying through that project. We also had projects that have they get off the rails and they're hard to get back on the rails. So, but we understand the council's direction to work with them and get those permits out as quick yeah. as possible. We understand that. Um, the one thing I want to make sure everybody understood is that since it's still city property, we have to make sure that there's full ADA compliance. And the big issue that is going to be is the parking lots have to be paved. Because they have to be ADA accessible, they have to be able to flow drainage. So um, those are some of the just things that, that are going to have to be looked at when we look at that site plan. So uh, sorry that this kind of, I was hoping to add clarity, not more mud. So I do apologize that I wasn't able to get all the clarity, all the mud out. Um, but I at least wanted people to understand kind of what the big kind of critical path items were. Mm. Um, and I think I think I've kind of done that, um, but I think we can continue to have conversations. That was kind of our intent was to begin to have those conversations about where are we getting high centered and how do we get unhigh centered. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Sullivan, again for um, clearing it up as much as mud. <laughs> so, um, have we um, have we reviewed the council minutes yet? Uh, so uh, I seeing more discussion see from see any sorry? any changes. I reviewed okay. the minutes. I did not see any changes. Thank you, Council uh, Member Fullerton. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, OK, um, so. Do we this kind of seems out of order, the the council open discussion versus going to the um, risk liability policy or uh, but, move it to the bottom, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get through the that before we go to council open. Right, uh, I'm with you on that. Um, Can we do that? Make Can a we motion. Move? We move motion. Uh, council open discussion to Any, after. Oh, I'm sorry. Second. All right. Any discussion on the matter? Good. Let's move. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor of uh, moving uh, item D discussion risk liability policy um, above um, item C council open to su discussion. Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that's a 6-0 vote because the record needs to uh, reflect that council member uh, Roach was in absentia. Um, all right, so uh, do we have any further things to discuss with the risk liability? Actually, <laughs> if, yeah, if I might. Okay. I, I know we've talked this talked about this a lot tonight already. <laughs> uh, the access and use agreement that the city attorney drafted up in, included our standard uh, commercial uh, general liability insurance requirements. Uh, as we mentioned before, it's the same agreement that we used with Chris Lear when he was accessing city property off of 96 to get in in the same limit. So those limits are uh, commercial general liability with no less than 2 million for each occurrence and 2 million in the general ag aggregate and then identi identifying the city as an additional insured. So that's just common practice that will mm -hmm. require insurance. They identify, they name the city as an additional insured. And when you say common practice, you officially. Uh, anytime, like any of our contractors, when we have contractors working on city property, they give us a certificate of liability insurance. And then there's a block at the end that says additionally insured, and it says the city of Bonnie Light. And it's standard business practices yes. as accepted in the aggregate. Okay. So again, uh, I don't have the date in front of me, but mid-January, Doug Clevenger got back to me. I believe I got back to him within a day or two with our response that the, what they proposed was not adequate. They came back with general aggregate, 2 million. Products completed operations aggregate, 1 million. 
personal and advertising injury for a million. Do not know what that is. Hmm. Each occurrence is a million rather than the two million. Right. Fire damage was a hundred thousand, and medical expenses for any one person five thousand dollars. So we sent this policy off to WCIA. Uh, uh, Mr. McEwen did, <laughs> uh, and like I said, we got back to Doug within about a day or two. Uh, let them know that it did not meet the provisions of the uh, access and use agreement. Uh, as uh, Mr. McEwen suggested, we offered up the alternative of getting a one million dollar umbrella umbrella policy to raise that two million that million dollar occurrence up to the two million dollar. Uh, Ms. Robertson, would joint and several liability apply in this situation? Several liability. Always and forever. Choice hotels. So join several liability, and yes, and and I'll just explain to the council what that is. Is in Washington, um, if you have let's just say a car accident and the person is driving drunk, uh, and they hit someone in a crosswalk, and the person in the crosswalk sues, they sue the driver, but they also sue the city because the side they own the crosswalk. If the city is 1% at fault and it's say a $2 million judgment, um, the person driving the car has no money, has low insurance limits. They can collect the whole $2 million, not just the 1% of 2 million, the total $2 million from the city of Bonnie Lake. So um, that's what, that's what happens in that situation. And it's really unfortunate because you could have almost no liability and still end up paying the whole judgment as cities too often are doing. So in other words, them presenting a 5,000 for each individual occurrence does not, um, um, uh, it's, can't think of the word, it's getting way too. It's low. inadequate. The 5,000 for medicals, it, very, very low. It probably wouldn't even cover a broken ankle. Right. <laughs> okay. So again, I think as we talked about earlier, there's several options. Uh, they could keep this policy, MRAC, mm -hmm. uh, if they were able to get a million dollar umbrella to bring the uh, each occurrence up to that $2 million threshold, name us as an additionally insured. Uh, we talked about the option if they retained a consulting engineer who had these $2 million thresholds, we could craft up a quick separate uh, access and use agreement with their consulting engineer to get that okay. on the property. Uh, there's alternatives that are available. And then finally, uh, although not recommended, uh, Paul, council could give us to, uh, direction to accept these limits as presented. Uh, again, not recommended, not recommended by staff, not recommended by your risk manager, or not recommended by your insurance provider. Or not recommended by WCIA. Or, right. right. Okay. Any, any discussion, guys? Mm -hmm. Yes, Council Member uh, Swamin. No, yeah, I, I, it sounds like there might be a solution for them working through their contractors or whatever, but, you know, I would relay a personal story because, of course, you know, in the construction industry, there's a lot of folks that do work for us um, in my business, and we've had instances where, you know, somebody working for the contractor literally a year later came back and said, I got injured on your job and sued you know the company and companies just because they had an injury that nobody ever knew about it's just ridiculous nowadays that the liability is ridiculous but it's you know hopefully we can work something out because it sounds like there's an avenue through the contra or the whatever you know the person that could go on the site would get would have the insurance normally so hopefully you know the executive can work something out to make it happen Oh, ever hopeful just, for that. It is just mercury. It's just, it's, it's ridiculous out there. The liability is just insane. No, that's true. Any uh, further uh, discussion? Well, you missed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, he's good. <laughs> I've elected to a committee council member. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the risk liability yeah. committee. Wait, no. um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, grateful that we now know there is an alternative option for MRAC to be able to do this. I know in my discussions with them, the biggest hang up has been that they're going to have to pay thousands of dollars for this policy and still not know if there's any uh, use of this land for them. And that is, I mean, anybody should know that if, if you are a for-profit or a non-profit money is money and it's expensive and it's hard to pay that out of your pocket when that could be money that goes to permits or whatever else it is. So knowing that we have this option to give to them now, 
helps a, a ton. But I just want to make sure like there, there was some in our last council workshop, there was things told to us that there are people that are accessing this land that are not permitted to access this land as homeowners in the neighborhoods around them. Fireworks are being lit off. I want to understand there is no trespassing signs on this property, correct? So if there are no trespassing signs on this property and we have allowed any group, any human being to be on this property, what the liability on the city then? Like if, if a homeowner is out there lighting off fireworks or they're having a birthday party or a scout troop is out there and they don't have an access and use agreement and they don't have the same insurance, what happens to the city if they get sued because somebody gets hurt out there? There's a legal concept called assumption of the risk. As long as we have um, the proper amount of um, no trespassing signs out there is obligated by any sort of municipality, um, then if they choose to ignore those signs, they're assuming a, a risk. And if they try to sue the city, we can use that as a defense to try to mitigate things. So, I mean, that's the best you can do. I mean, you can't chain people up not to go on property that they're not supposed to. So as long as we are covered by the proper, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Robertson. What I was going to say is discussions about legal risk really should occur in executive session. Okay, that's even better. <laughs> Any further discussion? Hmm. I guess, is there a yeah. path though, or do we have, are we going to, somebody going to get with well, uh, Yeah, what Mr. Sullivan indicated, we will uh, reach out to Doug Clevenger, I believe he's okay. back on the 22nd, and Scott Knoll will provide him with a copy of this presentation and offer to sit down with him. And you we'll, said you were on the phone with Scott. Did he yep. hear all, a lot of this? Good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I let him know what was said in the meeting. All right, good. <laughs> you know, I'm doing the same exact thing. Yeah. <laughs> Teamwork. <laughs> I clarify something I said before. Certainly, if they have an engineering firm needing access to the property, we could do an agreement with them. If there are other parties wanting to go on the property, we would certainly want those other parties to either have their own insurance or or be covered as an, an you know, covered under the in, engineering firm. Yeah. So we'd want MRAC to sign a hold harmless, you know, so we would want to make sure typically what you do is whoever the main contact is, whether it's the main contractor in something, they're required to have a certain level of insurance and name the city as an additional insured. And then any subcontractor that they have are required to do the same. I think even so, before working on the yeah. property, the great thing is they just need to figure out how to access the site to create a site plan. Yeah, I mean, if they have one in engineering firm doing it, then that's yeah. all we would need. Okay. So I just yeah, wanted to make that clear. But if other people are going on, that is what I can. There might be additional license agreements or hold harmless. Yep, yeah, he is aware of that now. Thank you. Yep. All right. Well, let's now work backwards and go to item C and open discussion. Do we have anything to openly discuss outside of the uh, policy, Councilmember Fullerton? Yeah. So um, I was going back through the. Bill, the uh, D2402 with all of the ordinances and everything. So now I have it all color coordinated. Um, and I realize that this is maintenance. I, I would like to bring this back or parts of it back to um, either council or the CDC because um, my concerns are that this was brought to the council as like a massive bill and there should have been like a table of contents that was itemized or at least had page numbers where you could access, you know, say the sewer parts of it. Okay, well, what page do I need to look at to get the definitions and all of the issues that are being changed or discussed? Um, the exact wording is on what the ordinance is um, going to be changed to, not just a summary, but what's the exact wording of the ordinance that, that you're wanting to change. And then um, it was brought to the council blindly without giving any specific language, in my opinion, and um, because of all of the information that I listed above. So I'm just saying, um, I would like to bring this back for council discussion at some point, or at least parts, if anybody has any questions on any of these items. But um, I, I'm just saying for, for me personally, I will never vote yes on another 
bill that looks like this. I want to have um, single items or at least if you have two different issues with like uh, the sewer, two different issues with water, you know, put the two ordinances together and then we can discuss those two. But to have 20 different ordinances that you want to have changed, that's that's unacceptable to me because there wasn't enough time to go through all of this and we didn't actually get an opportunity to discuss this in CDC because we were dealing with um, Granger Springs and then it got to full council under um, CDC issues and we had a couple of questions but we didn't really have a chance to go through the whole entire thing. Um, so I mean this is like 39 pages or something and I, I more than that but anyway that's just that's my concern i would like to in the future not have something like this brought forward because i i will not i will not vote on it okay and the discussion council member uh, baldwin um yeah i think it is to my understanding and again correct me if i'm wrong but um cdc has been you know like milling at this for quite a while this large chunk of things um, and it is also my understanding that council or CDC has already expressed to um, just staff that they do want it, I think, in smaller chunks, if I'm remembering correctly, like just maybe less presented. I feel like that that is that right? That's what we're trying to do. But... Yeah. And I would agree with uh, Council Member Fullerton, um, even just from the perspective of the public. You know, if we're trying to, um, you know, uh, have residents look at things, I mean, even when they look at, you know, some of the smaller chunks of things that we have, it's really hard for them to fully, you know, grasp what they're looking at. And so um, I would I would have to second that and agree. So question for you, because yeah. Councilmember Fullerton, um, she's new to the committee, of course, CDC, and, and this ordinance did go through planning agency and all yeah. the process. I know it's been... <clears throat> I'm pretty familiar with that, but just procedurally wise for the full council, it's my understanding that if we're going to reconsider the ordinance itself, we'd have to do it at this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if, if Councilman Folderson wants to like bring a look motion. at the whole thing yeah. or pieces of it or. Well, OK, so this is a discussion. This is open discussion. So my question to the council would be um, if any of you would like to um, revisit this particular ordinance that was 20 ordinances long um if you would like to re if you would like to review it then would you like to see the whole entire thing again and have it piece by piece or would you like to pick apart the um the certain ordinances that you know, maybe weren't being deleted, but were being changed because to me, I'm looking at the summaries and I'm not seeing any definite changes. You have to actually go through um, the other parts of the ordinance, which there's no page number on your little summary sheet. So how did all of us actually go through this thoroughly to make sure that nothing got past us? Um, you know, so would you would you like to review the whole entire thing and pick it apart at at some point, or do you want to pick and choose what you would like to look at, or uh, just nothing at all? That's Mayor Baldwin. Um, I know for me, uh, I did you know speak with um, you know people in CDC that were on it um, in regards to this large chunk of things, and I um, very with much difficult uh, difficulty read through the read through the document and you know and a lot of it is is obviously legal legal language and things like that and so it's already really hard to understand i i do think that i i have an understanding of things when i read things and so i think um i i'm okay with it because i i did read through it um but it was quite taxing and so i think just maybe from this point forward um, that we just make sure that, you know, when things this large of a chunk, well, that we just don't get a chunk like this. Well, we deliberately had Mr. Sullivan write it, so. You, you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, Ouch. It's, a, it's one of those balancing acts. <laughs> every time, every time we do an ordinance, we have to 
publish it in the newspaper. And so the one topic we were dealing with in this one was code maintenance. We could bring and every one of those sections could be an ordinance, but then you're paying for publication of every one of those ordinance. And I believe a publication is about how much. Yeah, so you know, every every time we publish an ordinance, we have to then publish that title in the newspaper. And so trying to balance those things is why we kind of grouped all the maintenance stuff together. Um, Councilmember Clemens did talk to me about this at CDC. Um, and so what we're going to do this year is we're going to bring Title 19, Title 18, Title 17. They still might be very long, um, but we're bringing the titles. Um, so at least that's a th that's they're all the same kind of grouping of ordinances. Um, I think the challenge with legislation is you can't just start on page one and read to page 29 because it's jumping in and out of different codes. And Councilmember Kleiman's asked me how kind of I do this. Typically, when I'm reading the ordinance and working on it, I have the actual adopted code up next to me and I'm reading them together so I can see what the section before and the section after is because you can't get that from the ordinance because we don't put the whole code in the ordinance. We just put the sections that we're amending. Um, one thing that I did tell Councilmember Fulton I thought was a great idea is when we do the, that's why we did the summary matrix to at least try to identify the topics and what was changing in a very less muddy way. Ordinances are always going to be muddy. Well, but are you showing the exact lang language before and then after? I felt like they were summary. No, the in the code, it actually is in legal, out, legal black. In line. the matrix. In the matrix, we're not. The matrix is just meant to be, hey, this is what we're changing and why. How it's actually being changed is in the ordinance itself. One of the th we can we can play with a couple different ways to do that. And Councilmember Fulton had a great idea, and I think we'll do it on the next one. Is on the matrix, just put the page number in the ordinance where that amendment is. Yeah. So that you could have your matrix. Yeah. And then have the so ordinance. Watching. Go see what was changed. Yeah, and then yeah. you you could look at that. That would be extremely helpful. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we can break it down into smaller chunks as well. Okay. All right, Deputy Mayor. Something. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, something uh, Brian Johnstone and I had talked about uh, previously in bringing stuff forward like this, especially stuff that's this wordy and and whatnot, and as as ordinances, uh, is to do a line through option so you can see exactly what the change is, and then here's the new one, what it will be. I think that would make things mm -hmm. a lot easier. Yeah. That's where you could do side by side comparison. That, yes. That's that's, that's, that's actually what's standard. in the actual ordinance. If you open if you own the ordinance, it has struck out underline yeah. that shows what was removed and what was added. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Roberts. I was going to say what's in the actual ordinance because we have to show the existing code and how it's changed very clearly under yeah. state law. So if you look at, I'm just, I just have it open on my phone the ordinance. So if you look at the ordinance, if it's an amended section of code and the link and the text is not underlined and not stricken through, it is existing code. If it's got a strike through a word or one or more words with the strikeout text, that is language that is being removed. If it's underlined or sometimes double underlined, that is new language that's being added. And so when you actually look at the ordinance yourself, you can see it's called legal black line is that kind of formatting. You can actually see the changes to the existing code in the ordinance itself, if that makes sense. Okay. I guess I've just never noticed the underlines, but I've seen the strikeouts. Hey, uh, Council Member Swatman. Yeah. yeah, the underline means new words. It's added, it's yeah. added strikeouts deleted. So page numbers would fix. Yeah, I think page numbers and I think. Attaching the RCWs and the. We, yeah, we can attach the RCWs. It will it will make the overall packet okay. thick. The agenda item itself, I think, was like 50 or 60 pages, but the ordinance itself was only 27 pages. So yeah. as we attach those things, it will make the packets bigger. But we can glad we will gladly do that. Um, I'll sit around and stew and see if there's another way we can make more more clear. Because the in, the issue isn't trying to make it not clear; it's just trying to make it in a sense how it all lines out together. Put an asterisk on the RCW and then put it on the last page. 
and then, In other and words, then say where, what page that asterisk is going to be on. Mm -hmm. If you're doing the RCWs, you could do the same thing with the Bonnie Lake Municipal Code, put an asterisk. This will be on page, you know, 50. Yeah, I'm sorry, you, if and there's... You can reference back and forth. If there's references to the existing Bonnie Lake Municipal Code, are you wanting those in the packet as well? If you're if you're changing something, I, no, I need to know what the what the wording is that you're changing. Yeah, that's always in the ordinance. That's the the actual legislation well, then shows. That would be the page number where I can find those changes. Which you know, I've I've been back and forth. I've been literally working on this for hours and hours for the last three weeks, and I I just kind of felt bombarded on when it got sent to CDC issues at the council and. You know, everybody seemed okay with it, so I didn't really speak up, but then it just started eating at me and eating at me, and I was like, this isn't right because I spent so many hours on this, and um, it's not that I didn't read it because I did, and I, I think I pretty much understand, but at the same time, I still have questions on, on like, the um, aborvites or uh, arborvites. Arborvite. Yes, and we we removed those from being considered a tree, so we, we don't have to have permits for cutting down their hedges. Because yeah. <laughs> technically, by genus and species, our varieties are trees. And but then it also says removal of critical areas is governed by the critical areas code, mm -hmm. and so that's not in there. So does that mean that if this arborvitae is in a critical area, then no, this it's excluded or is it included? So they can still cut this down. I, I would say typically we don't find arborvitaes in wetland buffers. But what if you do? I guess is what she, I think she's asking. Well, I mean, she's, I, uh, I live on a bluff. So if you when you get into critical what areas, you sometimes. can't remove any vegetation without a permit. So it doesn't matter if it's an arborvitae or if it's a cottonwood or if it's an alder. Once you cross that demarcation line of it's a critical area, you can't do work in a critical area without some sort of approval, and that's state law. But I don't think that Council Member Fullerton is talking about the substance of the code. It's the right. It's how you can work through the code. And that's what I'm trying to say. So if we right. reference the if we reference, you have to comply with the critical areas code or you wanted me to put the entire critical areas code in the packet, at least the site. Well, the sites in the ordinance. OK, critical areas code is defined as title uh, three of the of the. Title 16. Well, see, like okay. it says, um, the city's regulation uh, BLMC is 16.60.040. Point C, you know, so that I don't know how many pages that is in the Bonnie Lake Municipal Code, but that would be something that I could reference in the back with a little asterisk, you know, and this is page we'll 30. <laughs> we, we can do this, but we. We, well, there's no high. Well, we could put hyperlinks in the digital copy, but if you want them in the actual packet, I will let you know the packets for ordinance because I will get I will get all the jokes. So I'm, I'm warning you now; they will be over a hundred pages. I can for those I, I can handle you know on my digital copy going through the hyperlinks. That's fine, you know. But it as long as I can see it here, you just put the link you know, write down the code and then I'll go, oh, I need to go to page 81 in my packet and find the hyperlink so I can read all of the there above. So it doesn't have to be in the paper copy, okay. but make it blue or make it, you know, underline it so I know, oh, there's a hyperlink for this one. I'm going to go back and I'm going to go look at that. And the challenge we have with putting the hyperlinks as underlined in the ordinance is it becomes then part of the legal lining that we're adding that language okay so we can't really okay. we can't in the ordinance add the underline to the hyperlink because of the way we have to legally write it asterisk a little star something <laughs> in the we can't put an asterisk in the ordinance either because then that asterisk becomes part of the code okay so then it, then that footnote would then be carried forward to the code what i would what i would recommend put it in we can put the hyperlinks for example in the matrix we could do that and what i'd recommend is when you're reviewing the ordinance, having the city's municipal code open online, yeah, and that is all you can click on and move all the way around. So you can, if it's 16, you know you go to Title 16, and I can, we'll do our best to try to clarify it. Um, we'll we'll scratch our brains and try to figure out some new ways. Councilmember Swami, 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, uh, you know, as the council members point out, it was in committee for a couple of uh, iterations there. And, you know, I'd encourage your council members to pull things off, not that you didn't, right? You know, this is, that I'm always happy to, you You can, as me as a chair, you know, call me up and say, hey, this one's hot or whatever. I don't understand this. You know, I'm on public safety. I want to take a look at it. We'll make sure it gets down to the workshop. I'm, I probably like misplaced it a little bit on this um, council agenda. It should have went to workshop first, possibly. Um, something that large, but you know, something that has been examined by planning agency. The planning agency went through, like I said, an extensive public process with it that they have to do. So to me, we got to, you know, there's a balance between trusting the committee's work, meaning like planning agency in this case, because they think they never do anything, right? Speaking of a later so, item. Right? <laughs> you know, well, that's a great segue. Then, <laughs> you got to like no, figure it all that. It's a, it's a nuance there, but, you know, because clearly I don't, I don't have the, all the details of the ordinance myself. I concentrated on like a section, you know, focused on the sewer section, let other committee members focus on other sections of interest, but that's how I got through it. So. Yeah. All right. Do we have any further open discussion before we move to Deputy Carter? Um, Who's first? <laughs> Council Member Hubler. Um. Is it possible to get these massive packets like that, like well in advance? Not that they're going to be discussed that next week's meeting, but like say a month in advance. You know, you already have been working on this because we already had it in planning commission. Yeah. You've already had it in committees. Can it go out to the entire council months in advance or a month in advance or whenever you're looking at it? I had, I had an extra time with it because I was on planning commission and I worked through this. So I knew what to expect, but I get where everybody else is coming from and they didn't have that same, like if you're some, if you're sending something to planning commission, could it go to city council at the same time of like, Hey, we're looking at this. And then here's some revisions after the revisions come from planning commission. So that way there is time. I mean, Oh man, I know what you guys go through. And then we are fitting this into our full time jobs too. No, and we and can just we can, giving us a little more time. We can work. I just, Sadie, how would we do that? I just, yeah, but no, almost none of them you have to adopt right away, right? No, but it was brought to us to adopt, and and that was just to give more time instead of having it on sure. that week's agenda only. Then yeah. it would be like come to us earlier, just just to preview it. Well, you know, but again, I, you know, I would, yes, mentioned a, earlier. I would recommend that if there's any questions and it's not a time sensitive kind of ordinance that comes before the council, that the council tables it for a couple of weeks because they need more, you know, time to deal with it, right? We can do that, or if they can give it to us earlier, like because we already can't it's give already us gone. a free do in my mind because it's not done yet. Right? No, but you guys got it in CDC, right? As a preview, you guys no, got we it. No, we weren't done with it in committee yet. So, because we do things in committee that the council doesn't see before, you know. Let's we'll, let, we'll tweet hold on. Let, let's address Council Member um, McClyman's uh, concern. That's what I'm saying. It's not. Fully so, um, to your point, what I learned like a year ago, one it took me a little while, mm -hmm. right? Was that I look at all of the committee's agendas and I try to review all of the topics on all of the committees. I get notification of all those mm -hmm. agendas for things that I want to look at, because that's the only way I can like understand what's going on, because then I can then I can talk to the deputy mayor, right, or to council member Baldwin and say, I'm concerned about this topic, right? OPMA kind of puts us in a stupid place where it's hard to not create some sort of a chain meeting or something, but we still can do that. The other re thing is that the workshops are our best opportunity to have discussion with each other about where things are at. Well, the pertinent so, question is, do you have the code side by side when you're reviewing? Absolutely. There you can. <laughs> our code, the search function in our code works really good, right? Oh I use God. it a lot. I look at it a lot. The folding, unfolding works good. The RCW, um, you know, website works really well, too. Um, once you learn how to navigate all that stuff, takes a little bit, right? But once you do, but you do need, I I, um, I have like uh, three monitors when I work on this stuff, right? So one, <laughs> right? But no, I, I, that's because well, I'm a geek. seen my office upstairs, it's the same thing. I have three monitors. Yeah, that's what you need. Anyway, bottom line is, 
I find the staff to be very good at supporting us. We just need to ask and do it. And like council uh, member Swapman saying, it's is that, you know, don't feel rushed and just ask to just stop. Yeah. Right. And, and you can always ask a question. What happens if we, you know, don't pass this tonight? Right. <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Council member Baldwin. Um, so just now I was uh, looking up some BLMC, um, one specifically just to see if I could find it. Um, I, I had Googled it and then it took me to the land use page, um, but not actually to the Bonnie Lake Municipal Code itself. So then I went into the search engine, you know, the, on the site, it's the city site and punched in BLMC. And then I put in the specific code I'm looking for. And I kid you not there's a lot of results. Mm -hmm. And so, and none of them say that it's specifically that yeah, I would, Bonnie Lake Municipal Code. I wouldn't say you would want to Google it. You would want- Well, I'm on the website now. You wouldn't even want to go to the website. You want to go to actual mm -hmm. code where our Bonnie Lake Municipal Code is hosted. So if you go to governance in the, in the drop down on our city website, yeah. you will see a tab that says Bonnie Lake Municipal Code. The, Bonnie Lake Municipal Code is not hosted on our website. It is hosted on a third party server that is called Code Publishing. So you have to be on. Where it says just municipal code? Yes, ma'am. Mm. And that will take you to Code Publishing's website that has our municipal code on it. And that's the one. And I can, I can get with Sadie to make sure the council has a specific link for that. But yeah, you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to Google it or go to the city's website yeah. and go into the website search and, and search the code because it's not talking with the other website. It's just. And I would recommend if, if you wanted to Google it, if you Googled Bonnie Lake Municipal Code 3.2.27. That's what whatever, I did. But not BLMC. No, I typed out Bonnie Lake Municipal Code 16.20.0. Yeah, it'll come up with like a different, a lot of different results. It did take me to the city website. Oh, Councilmember Baldwin, I can, if you want to get a, get with me, I can show you exactly how to navigate. Well, I see it. Okay. Yeah. Then, then you on, once you're on there, there's a search function at the top in the upper. Yeah. Search right. code. Yep. Upper, and, right. Yeah. And you could type in the BLMC and it'll take you right to it. That seems really hard for our residents. It is. Yeah. It's complicated. Uh, right? That's, but because hey, you can look at those codes today and we yeah. adopted this ordinance and I was probably a 30 day ordinance or whatever, you know, and, and that's going to be inconsistent with the ordinance we just adopted. Right. Yeah. This is, this is the way it is done in <laughs> every city. If you, if you went to the MSRC website, you could actually see how many cities are using code publishing for their ordinances. <laughs> it, it is the industry standard, except for like Bellevue or Seattle, who do their all their own codes. Right. Or Municode, which has a, I don't like. Can, yeah. Can y'all imagine the first city council meeting back in 1949, listening to what we're saying? They would be I, I don't think they would understand. Oh, no, they word. would be really mad at us. <laughs> I get that. Do we have a, do we have a link on our website? that takes people to code publishing? Yeah, so if that's what I see. If you go to governance and go to municipal mm -hmm. code and you click on that, it'll take you right to the Bonnie Lee code publishing website. You can't tell that you're on code publishing because it has the Bonnie Lake logo on it. Code publishing is just the host. Like I said, it's still in, ultimately you really have to get with staff in the end to make sure that, you know, what you think, what you're reading is actually what the truth is because there's nuances of mm -hmm. layers and there's always a there's always a a drag too so <laughs> if, if you were to go on to code publishing today to find the ordinance that you passed last week it won't be there for probably a month so even though it's in effect and it is now the law of the land once the five-day process passes mm -hmm. it takes code publishing a period of time to do their process to go through and update it. And that's at any level, even the RCW. Yeah, even the RCWs drag behind once the state legislature passes. There's that gap between them physically going in and hand keying in all of the changes. Some of us remember paper code books. Oh, no, no. And carbon no, paper. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Those were worse because every time, every time you pass an ordinance, we would get new pages and we have to slide <laughs> them in and out. Sweet. Uh, I love it. 
All right. Any further discussion? I, I, I can literally hear Deputy Mayor Carter chomping at the bit to get to his part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Councilmember Member Klein. Are, are we done with that discussion? I have one thing to discuss in open council yes. discussion. Okay, so um, uh, the uh, there is a systematics policy, politics class that's being offered. I took this. I took another class from this organization. I found it fascinating. Uh, the focus is really on the Constitution, mm -hmm. right, and understanding the Constitution. So I think it's fabulous. Um, U.S. or Washington? U.S. Both. Okay. The the one I took was both. It was it started with the U.S. and explained where the state constitution was at, and then it walked through the revised code of Washington. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, it was. I mean, the the gentleman really knew his stuff. So I would endorse it. I'm going to take this class as well, um, and uh, I will send Sadie the link. So if you want to go, um, it's two hours on Saturday morning, March March ninth. Uh, okay. I'm going to go. Um, I think it'd be fabulous and. You know, the 150th anniversary of the Constitution is coming up. So really think we need to work as a council to like, I, I would like to make sure that we highlight it and take an active part in understanding it and, and getting the community excited about it. All right. Any comment? Okay. Oh. Oh, oh, yeah, Deputy Mayor Carter. Thank you. Uh, on another note, uh, I just want to say we attended the uh, ribbon cutting for the food bank lockers uh, on Wednesday. Uh, they're over there right by the uh, library. You can see them now. They're all wrapped and everything, uh, looking great. I went over right before this meeting. I talked to the library to see kind of, hey, how are they working out or whatnot? Um, they were initially thinking they were going to be stocking them twice a day. It sounds like they're stocking them four times a day right now uh, because they've they're doing such a great job, I guess. Everybody loves them. Um, so I just wanted to let council know about that, that that's out there. Oh, and before. Uh, and they thanked all of us and all of you as well for all of your participation and, and helping out with that, making that occur. So thank you to staff and to the council. And thank you, Deputy Mayor Carter. Uh, and before we move on, I would be remiss if I did not mention our, um, uh, the sem well, the uh, presentation that we had here at the uh, at City Hall this past Saturday from um Community court and all of the um, uh, and all of the resource centers and therapeutic centers that did show up, we were jam packed. They had to actually put people on the second floor to go all the way around, and we had we had a lot of positive response, and um, uh, and they were even uh, so we're getting the message out there. So uh, I was. Uh, Glad to see it when I when I got here. So just the positive response that came from that. So anyway, let's uh, move on to I'm so sorry. Our, oh, uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> Council I Mark. think you raised your hand first. Um, I, I have a couple questions. Um, going back to Allen York Park stuff. Um, I don't see it coming up anywhere, so I want to make sure my head is wrapped around Allen York Park and the parking stuff. Um, People are going to be asking. I don't see anything on the website. I see on there. The only thing I see is the Allen York Park Restricted Parking Zone B permit. What is that for? So that is for the people for the people who live on the streets um, around Allen York Park. They can get a free um, pass from Sadie, so they can continue to park on the streets like they normally would. This was the ordinance that Council passed last summer in response to some of the issues we were having at Allen York Park that kind of allowed the parking around Allen York Park on the streets to only be by permit. Permit is free, cost is free. You just have to get with Sadie and show that they actually live on that street. They get, I think, two passes. Okay. And, that, and that's how we're gonna enforce to make sure that those streets aren't getting taken up by. Yeah, the residents were complaining. A lot of them. yeah, and so that's how we kind of get riffraff allowed the residents yeah. to continue to park on the streets without just putting up no parking signs. Okay, it's mm -hmm. kind of a downstep from that. Allen York Park as a whole, we are meeting internally every week to come up with a plan. Um, our plan is to hopefully brief um, the Public Safety Committee first part, last part of March, first part of April on the plan for Allen York Park. That plan will include a public and education about the changes in Allen York Park, the parking on the streets, the paid parking in the parking lots, 
we are doing that as a joint effort between um, emergency management, my staff, and the police department so that we have a coordinated plan for Allen York Park this summer. Chief Barry, who's online, has been part of those conversations along with um, AC uh, Jim Keller. And we're coming up with a plan of how we're going to work together to have all of that. And once we have that plan together, we're going to put out education information once we present it to the Public Safety Committee for their kind of review and feedback. All right. So should I ask my questions now or wait for Public Safety Committee meeting? Because I think these are all things that hopefully you guys are already thinking about, but things that I want to make sure that are being answered and we have that answer when you guys bring it to us. We, we definitely can take all the questions. I might not be able to answer okay. them tonight, but we can add them to the list. No, it's just more, it's just having the answers out there so you know kind of like where my brain's going. Um, so, you know, of course, how are we gonna handle the parking this year? How is it gonna be enforced if it's paid parking? How are people gonna pay for that paid parking? What's the cost for the parking equipment? The equipment that people have to use to pay? Those I can actually answer pretty quickly. Okay. So the ordinance for the paid parking says that it's uh, four dollars for the four hours, I think, or ten dollars for all day. Don't quote me on that. That's the what I remember from the ordinance, but that's already been established by the council. Um, the way you do it is with your smartphone. There is no equipment other than signs at the park. Um, Leslie is currently working with the vendor to figure out how many signs we need to put up, where we're going to put them up, and we're going to have a map. But all it will be is a sign that says, here's how you pay for paid parking. We'll have a QR code on it. You scan the QR code with your phone and you pay with the phone. We are working with the how we're going to deal with the field rentals because the field rentals did include their parking as part of that from what I've been told with, from my kind of handoff. So we're working with kind of developing a basically code that they would put in when they scan the QR code that would basically zero out their zero out their cost um, and then their license plate would then be in the app and when the police run the list of license plates they would be able to know who has paid for that parking and who hasn't that answered one of my questions how who are we paying to enforce parking uh, it's the Bonnie lake police department okay which that's a whole nother source of contention too because of everything they have to deal with that has been a major source of contention at public safety the past year and a half. Yes, it has, and there's been some changes in the state law, which kind of made us direct it over to the PD. Um, it has to do with limited commissions. Okay. All right, Councilmember Baldwin. Um, speaking of Alan York, um, I was a little confused at a recent conversation at Public Safety um, where Ball Field 4 was no longer being considered for temporary uh, boat trailer parking. And, you know, in the year and a half conversations that we've had at Public Safety, you can listen to all the different meetings. Um, we were discussing alternative uh, boat trailer you know, that was going to be temporary. And so, um, I don't know, I'm a little shocked by that. So I don't really know where that, where that went sideways. Nancy and Jeff even came and talked to me who are regular yeah. attendees How, of uh, public safety. And they were like, what happened? And I was, I don't know. Uh, my recollection is it came to council once we got the cost to basically because we can't to, to basically drive on it, we'd have to rip the grass out because there's irrigation systems in there. And so there was a presentation that Ryan made uh, late 2023. I mean, he about he the cost us, of converting. Yeah, he gave us two options. One was to gr do gravel, and then the other was to uh, to pave it. And then we had talked about um, the gravel, and then but then even before that, we had talked about uh, the potential for other alternatives yeah and my understanding was that the, at, when it got to the council level the decision was made not to move forward at the council level with any loss of that ball field because of the limited number of ball fields that we so what is the so the long-term plan that was in the allen york plan that we presented to council no, i saw long term what's the short term we this is going to hit the fan there's going to be resident they're already starting to get heated online about it yeah i don't there is no just 
Councilmember Fullerton, can you, are you addressing oh, yeah. the subject that's going on right now? Same. Okay. So, yeah. The thing is, is that when we do the uh, tunes at taps, they open up ballpark four and there's an access road. There is a little gate. They open the gate and they let the cars in and they let them park as, you know, over override parking, whatever you want to call it, overflow. but overflow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so they're doing that. The city staff is doing that anyway, during tunes at taps and Bonnie Lake days and taste of taps, all of those things, they open up those gates and they let the cars drive in and they let them park on the grass. So I don't understand why. And that was an, a question that I had for Ryan before why we can't just open up the gates on a busy day and let people in. We're just not going to rent out that ball field. But like there's already an access road. They're already letting cars park on there. The boat trailers are not weighted down because there's no boats on them. So like you should just and we we opened up the the Moriarty property. That was just dirt road and they just let people park in there. It wasn't about the mud or anything else. And it's the same thing, you know, yeah, maybe the grass is going to get torn up, but there's no reason why people can't park on there because they're already doing it. So, so I, I think, unfortunately for this year, um, where I sit today, I've been working on this now for a month, um, where I sit today, I don't think ball field four would be available the rental people have already been running that field for the summer for other for baseball and other sporting events so i don't think that is an option this year um i think we can work on a plan for next year why i i can't speak to a lot of the specifics i do know there was a presentation about it i i, I can't remember it was, i want to say it was last fall or early last year about kind of taking ball field four away and turning it into parking. Um, the consultants came through and put, did a presentation on that as well. And there, that count, at that council meeting, there was direction that we did not want to lose ball field four from providing sports fields now, for uh, people. Now, Mr. Sullivan, are you stating that this summer on Wednesday evenings, starting at about four o'clock, or, or, or have they rented out for sports activities? No, Wednesday now? evenings are are kind of xed out on the calendar. Or tunes at tap. Or tunes at tap, and that's for all uh, parties. Uh, so a limited engagement, a limited event. It, we open the field for overflow parking, but we keep, we can't do it every day for the um, uh, for the boats. Yeah, and the highest peak would be on the Saturdays and Sundays, which is when the sports leagues are trying to rent it to run tournaments for for baseball. So that's what I'm saying. I think I just don't think this year, within 90 days, we can get all of that squared away. Okay. Um, as I said, I'm asking for a little bit of grace. I understand people are going to be mad. Um, we are working this issue, um, and long term, we have a solution that could even be a temporary option. Long term. Um, I'll put my head together with staff and um, the police department to see what else we can do. And okay, and we'll come up, we'll come up with something. Yeah, Madam Clerk, has something to say. Sorry, the the meeting that they're talking about the presentation where it got switched from parking to was the meeting that we had public commenters coming in because that's the feel that the girls' sports use, and so by taking it away. Yeah, the girls didn't have a spot, and so the direction was we probably need to keep it for field rentals for the girls. Yes, Captain Baldwin. We have to come up with a different plan. I I'm telling you, like th this is going to become a very large problem. You mean it like it's a even ball field with Bonnie Lake MREC? have issues, you know, with the fact that boat trailer parking. What is it, twenty three? spots i think it is yeah give or take um which is it's not enough and then people will then start parking their boat trailers i mean it's just a mess 
at Allen York once all the boating opens and we're already told that it's going to be like second half of March, it'll be full. The water will be, will be up to the, full you know, capacity. Mm. full capacity. Um, I just, I don't know. I feel like I understand that the, you know, the girls came, you know, as a part of the little league to talk about it, but like there, there's also a large amount of people that, you know, are sounding off, not maybe here at the meetings, but they are certainly sounding off to Nancy and Jeff Lincoln, who are speaking with the boaters in the community. Yeah. And, I, and they're very angry. And I think we were, that's just what we, we were just going off based on the direction the council gave us at that meeting. So, mm. you know, I, I can, I can go back and try to find exactly the date of that meeting. Um, but yeah, I remember there was a, cause there was a huge debate about eliminating sports fields when there's a, a low ability of having sports fields. And which I understand. I'm just right. saying like, I, I don't know where the ball, I just, okay. Well, I think it's why they're trying to. I'm sell. telling you, council, like this is a major so problem at public safety. Around, it is so. not a small one. We yeah, could, we. It was told that it wasn't right going to take but, very much time it, to tear down some of those buildings around the senior center that we, we'd be able to make those um, old uh, mm -hmm. public works We're buildings wait. become parking. So we are moving forward with that project. Um, We've got, um, there's two critical path items that have to be done. One is getting a utility pole relocated, which um, we are already working with and should be done this month uh, so that Chuck can move the servers out of the old public, uh, old public works city hall building. The other hurdle or challenge we have is we still have the historical society in there. Yeah, no, we, we can't, I, I don't want to. We don't can't tear the building down until the historical society mm -hmm relocates relocates yeah. moves into the new module right right you know. right so we've kind of we're like well, I, I think next year we're going to be further ahead I, and i'm going to do my best to manage it mm -hmm. in the next 90 days i just i'm not i can't guarantee you what tonight um but i will definitely take that and something we can talk about to see if there's anything we can so i guess like for public safety should we start communicating to residents early that there is going to be no change to parking at all I would say let me have a week to talk okay. with. Okay. Because they're already wanting to know why Bonnie Lake is not discussing that on, you know, on the website to let them know what's going to be going on. We're, we're trying to, our goal was to have that information available by March 1st. Okay. Um, or, I'm sorry, not March 1st, uh, April, in the April window, um, so that people would be ready kind of in May with what the changes are going to be. Um, I think they just need to know if the boat trailer parking is changing or not. It would not, I don't believe it would significantly change, but we will, I will get with, we have a meeting this Thursday um, internally to talk about Allen York Park and we'll put that on the agenda to see okay. if there's, if there's operations has any ideals Okay. and we have any ideas to, to, to provide some additional capacity. Okay. Uh, Councilmember member Roach. Just a question. Um, I haven't followed this real, I know there are some things that went on last year and everything, but do we know, Chris, there been an ad hoc committee or whatever to, to address this? And do we know who the complaints are coming for? Are they citizens of Bonnie Lake or are they outside the city limits? I mean, who They're are a mixture. They? Yeah. Okay, Because we might need to look at a policy on, are we required to have open access to everybody in the entire region? Because yeah. I don't think we should be. No, no. Um, we've so. brought it down to just Bonnie Lake residents. I think that was last summer that we did that this past summer. Two yeah. summers ago. I just want to make sure we're not we're not jumping over hurdles to appease people that live. In yeah, no, no. We've had those discussions in rounds and some more rounds. Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. I'm not. No, no, that's OK. Um, uh, oh, yes, <laughs> Councilman Paul. So sorry, you guys, but this is the only time we can be together. So um, so um, there is another um, hurdle, it sounds like. Um, I am, again, talking to Doug and Scott. Um, and so they are willing to spend tens of thousands of dollars on um, an engineering plan, uh, but their issue is the requirement in the MOU, which I remember them talking about, that indicates that they need to be in the parks plan. They're afraid that if they spend, you know, these, these thousands of dollars, that it that they won't be able to get past permitting. 
because of the fact that they're not in the parks plan because it's in the MOU. They, they, I do remember that. Yeah. And, and my, and that's why in the presentation, we specifically said it has been added. Okay, Both the so read, they're good. they're good. Yeah. The read property has been added as a future park and it has been, there has been language added in some of the narrative talking about working with MRAC. Excellent. It's just that plan will not be in front of the city council until May sometime. If, I remember correctly, though, they needed it to say MRAC and MRFC because some of the grants that they're trying to get are required under MRFC and they will be doing some of everything as the nonprofit side. I'm going to have to defer. I think the, right now the MOU is between Mount Rainier Athletic Club and the city. And Mount Rainier Football Club is not a member of the M MOU. It didn't expose mm -hmm. MRFC because that's a separate thing. That existed prior to. Well, anyway, excuse Council me, Member Council Baldwin. Member Baldwin. Um, yes. Or um, Hubler, maybe uh, should contact uh, um, uh, Scott and find out if maybe the council needs to pass a resolution that says they intend to work with MRAC and MRFC as part of establishing the park. If they need something to apply for grants, that, that was part of that public policy discussion. I, you know, I remember they came in and asked for something. We can pass a resolution, right? I feel like that's kind of what Doug was asking for in his presentation was that they needed MRAC and MRFC added into the plan so that they could apply for the grants that MRFC can apply for as the nonprofit. Yeah, but they won't get the plan before they need to apply for the grants. So do we need to pass a resolution that says the city council is endorsing this activity and plans on supporting them? Yes, I'm I'm pretty sure that's what they asked for. Mr. Sullivan. You, council, you've already done that with the MOU. It says to work with Mount Rainier Athletic Club. There's also that resolution that was passed in June of 2023 that says we direct staff to work with Mount Rainier Athletic Club and Ath Football Club to develop an agreement to develop the Reed property for multi-sports fields. So the council has already passed a resolution saying that exact thing um, in June of 2023. And then they have the MOU as well. Councilmember Baldwin. So sorry. Thank you for that clarification. I guess the other um, part, because definitions matter, um, you said qualified professional multiple times. What constitutes a qualified professional? Is it just a consulting engineer or could it be as another type of person? It could be Bob. You, you'd cer they'd certainly Because that's what they're asking. They'd certainly need licensed professional engineers to develop stormwater plans. They will need a traffic engineer to submit their traffic plan. This is all part of the site plan, so it's multiple. Yeah. Civil plan for civil. Mm -hmm. Plans would Probably. have to be done by a licensed engineer. Plumber for the fire. Is it possible for them to just have a meeting with like all the parties, like like you guys, and get all of their questions fully answered? I will. I will. They're, they're still asking me questions as I'm talking to them. Yeah, I will gladly. So I don't know if you're talking with Scott or Doug. both of them. Both. I will email Doug after tomorrow morning. And get a meeting with him set up with John. That'd be great. Next week. Okay. Thank you. And Scott. And Scott. Okay. I just found it's easier sometimes to go through Doug to get meetings set up with Scott. But yeah, I will. I will work to get that with John to get that meeting set up. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to our, our second <laughs> discussion item tonight: uh, committees versus uh, council as a whole. Uh, Deputy Carter, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so it's kind of come up a couple times uh, this evening, which is kind of interesting. Um, this is something I brought up several years ago uh, when I first got on council. Um, and I'm we're trying to figure out like what's the best way to make sure that all of us get the information that we need to do our job. So there are pros and cons to both, right? So um, some of the pros, uh, to committees is it's a less formal uh, location uh, and you can ask a lot more questions. You can really get in depth on a lot of the issues or whatnot, especially when you have, you know, giant <laughs> ordinances to go through or, or whatnot, like we heard earlier. Some of the downside is that uh, not all the council necessarily is in 
that meeting, right? So they don't hear everything. And so they might have some questions as to what exactly was going on. What were the questions that were asked? What were the answers? Uh, that kind of thing. It requires a certain amount of trust of your other council members. Um, and you still obviously have the opportunity to ask the questions of staff, ask the questions of you know the other members on the uh, on the committee or whatnot. Um, so those are kind of some of the pros and cons of of the committee. Um, the other side is doing a council of the whole. And one of these things, the reasons that this was brought up is uh, we've been pulling a ton of stuff off of uh, consent agenda or whatnot, um, especially lately. But um, we just have the last probably the last I don't know year or so, um, and so. There's a thought that uh, if you do a council of the whole, that the staff would only have to provide, you know, a, a presentation one time to everybody all at once. Everybody gets to hear it. Everybody gets to hear the other questions, uh, and that might spark questions of their own. Um, and and it could potentially save some time. It's it's hard to say, honestly. I think once we get talking and there's a bunch of us, I think it can obviously go late. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we have to figure out, you know, what what's best for us as a council. How do we want uh, to do this? So I know we just started uh, new committees and and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it it seems a little bit odd to bring it up, but it also seems like the right time to bring it up. Um, to think like, is do we don't have to do stuff just because it's the way it's always been done, right? So there's there's other ways to do it, and this is one other way. Um, so I don't know what council's thoughts are on that. I'm honestly about 50-50 uh, either way uh, with it. Um, I, I see the pros and cons of, of both sides. Um, so with that, that's kind of the presentation, I guess. And just to, just to be clear, you don't have to trust me. You, you have to trust each other. <laughs> I might real quickly. Uh, Council Member Swatman will remember we did we tried this five years ago. Oh, yeah. I, I think where we did a count committee of the whole for the mm -hmm. finance committee. I mm. uh, I think it was relatively short lived, but I mean we we have <laughs> in the past. But when well, and then maybe maybe Council Member Swatman can speak to what that was like. I guess. Oh yes. <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's a great idea. Um, I, I would highly recommend that the council members, if they have any questions that they do indeed, you know, get with the committee members or so forth to move those items on to a council of the, you know, large so that, that they get them all answered together. Um, conversely, as the deputy mayor points out, you know, that the technical issues, I don't, you know, I haven't been on public safety, so I don't know how long those usually go. But I can guarantee you that our public, uh, the CDC committee meetings, we spent hours talking about details and details and details that half of y'all are just like, you know, shut up and move on, right? <laughs> you, know, you don't want to know about them. And they're just irrelevant to a lot of people. And that's why we have uh, interest groups on different committees. So there's plus or minuses to that. Um, that's why, in my opinion, I think it's great that you have the committee, but the other council members are able to, you know, like council member McClemens points out, you know, calls up the other committee member and say, hey, I got a concern about X. And then that committee member or chair can say, you know what, I think this thing needs to go to the committee of the whole or the full council, right, um, before it moves on. Because there is a lot of nitty gritty technical, like I'm going to strangle somebody over the you know, side of the bench very quietly um, at committee levels. Mm -hmm. That just doesn't happen here. You know, um, the mayor's great at leading the meetings. He's also, in my opinion, somewhat annoying a lot of times. <laughs> He's like, shut up and move on. Um, and I'm not done, right? You know, because I, I, I don't know how it is in public safety, but uh, oh, I haven't been on finance forever either. It's just those those intimate discussions, I think, provide a lot of value to the council. And that's my opinion. Okay, and Councilmember Baldwin. Um, we spend the entire time in public safety talking about the things. I think the thing that I really love about this council and even the previous councils is just not a passive council. Um, and so I have confidence in the current council members and even the previous council members um, that the right questions are being asked in my absence. I will assure you that in public safety, um, even with our new members, um, the right questions are being asked. 
and um, we are challenging each other to make sure that we are not missing anything and that we're seeing things. I will guarantee you that if we bring public safety issues to open whole council, it will not save us time. Um, and not only that, but I love the the intimacy in the smaller group setting, especially the interactions I get to have with the staff. Like I don't get to have those kinds of interactions, you know, with them in this open and you guys are on the dais or you're down here and we're right. over there. You know, we're all sitting at a table and we're talking to each other and um, it's just way more personal. Um, and so the, the more questions are asked that maybe are a little more trickier. And I don't know, I just I, I like I like it. And, and again, we are asking the questions that are needed. And just a point of clarity on that, are other council members welcome to come to a committee that they are not on and participate? I mean, are they a part of the public? Not participate, so no. You would have okay. They may come. Oh, no. They can oh, that's the right. Game. Okay, yes. They can listen to the recording. No, that is a no. I think right. is I loved, you know, what, what we did in our, our first public safety committee, and I loved being on the finance committee and learning and being able to have those very intimate discussions like Angela's talking about. But I also know there are things that like I've gone back through and watched CDC meetings and it is really difficult to sit back and watch those. And they're, you know, an hour and a half long and you're just like, I can't hear half of it. And even though meeting minutes are there, those meeting minutes are not thorough to no. tell us what was fully discussed in everything. So when you can't fully hear, like, like if I hear, you know, I can hear Swatman and I can hear, you know, somebody else talking at the same time, but you can't really tell what's really going on when you're sitting there trying to listen to this. And that there's, there's been several of my friends trying to go back through and watch because I want to know what's been happening so that we know what's coming forward and it's really difficult to to catch all of it in those mm -hmm. to watch those recordings over yep it is yes it, do we have any uh, further uh, discussion that, that's a very salient point i agree with you on 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 that as far as the quality of video transcripts um but do we have any further discussion on the matter oh councilman mcclimans so um we could um, continue working as we are for like two years and then in two years and if we're still um, maybe struggling with pulling stuff off the consent agenda, consider it then or. Um, in two years. Yeah, and I guess I want to understand, <laughs> is it pulling stuff off consent agenda or is it putting stuff on consent agenda that is the issue? Yeah. Because I, I I don't want anything to do with property rights on the consent agenda. That <laughs> needs to be discussed by the whole council, right? Sure. And everybody needs to understand what's really going on there. So things like zoning, mm -hmm. right? Taking a property, um, those sorts of things. But I, yeah, I'm trying to understand. What is your involvement? I think I think that we can still save time. And again, having confidence in the council to ask the right questions in committee while at the same time, if something is on the consent agenda and we feel very bothered by it to go ahead and pull it. And I know it makes more work for the staff, but we do have new council members and that's, you know, there's gonna be stuff that gets pulled and there's gonna be extra questions like even at public safety, right? Like I I was gonna, I, was un, I knew that going into it, like you two were gonna need to ask more questions about things that were discussed because, you know, you're going to be helping make policy and you need to know what's going on. And so I think like, yeah, I mean, because I, I did when I came on too, like there were things that I just wasn't really sure about. Um, but as I've gotten to, you know, really understand the process and the things we've been talking about cycling through, um, you know, so I don't know. That's just my thoughts. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I think there's I think I can hear a consensus, right? <laughs> Which way we should go. Um, so thank you for that. I think it's a valid uh, conversation for us to have um, to think about, you know, what's the best way to to move forward. And I think uh, I think we're on the right track. Um, I think uh, myself, I'll use myself as an example. I need to be better about what stuff I just throw onto consent. If I think, you know, oh, I think everybody's going to go for this. What there's certainly times where people don't have all the information. And so, and then once once it comes to council and it gets pulled, 
uh, and then everybody hears it, they usually vote, oh yeah, I, I totally agree, right? So uh, exactly what I thought they would do, but they didn't have the information. So maybe I need to do a better job on that. I'll just use myself as that example, but um, maybe that would help solve some of the problem for staff. Well, it's and a very salient. We can yeah. move move forward together as we have been. And if he, and if, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. And if people do have questions about, you know, public safety, for example, that they think they might pull, you can also, you can talk to the chair mm -hmm. um, and we could let you know, you know, what was, what went on with that too. Well, and the focus should be uh, if uh, council members are not understanding what is going on, how are our citizens going to oh, understand that's what's going on? the concern. Yeah. So it's uh, the, the so, it, so just making it as transparent as we can for our citizenry, I think, would uh, work out quite fine. Uh, council Member Uh So I have a question for council, if I may. Oh, so yeah. if if I. If I talk to the chair on a topic that they've already talked about, is that considered a quorum? Is that a chain meeting? No. Adam Parliamentarian. So it 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 depends. If how do you get <laughs> the standard legal there you go. answer? That's I can tell you answer. Do how you much to... money I spent to learn that answer. <laughs> it depends. Well, it depends on so if all the three people are in agreement and you call, you know, or and you call one of them and then they take your comments back to the other three outside of the open meeting, that's a chain meeting. If you talk to one of them and say, Hey, I want you to know that, you know, I I, I want I don't think this should go on consent, um, et cetera you know, that's fine. You can go ahead and let them know that because you're not having a quorum. It's only when you're, and they're having their discussions in an open meeting. So if you're talking to them and then one's talking to another and they're talking to another or whatever outside the open meeting, that's an issue. So it really, it's very context and factually specific. I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer. Okay. <laughs> Just be careful. That's a more bold one. But I guess if, if some were to, come to me as the chair and ask like, oh, with this, you know, whatever it is um, that's on consent, you know, can you tell me more about it? I mean, I'm just explaining to them what we talked about in an open meeting, right? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm just listing out these are the, this is what it's about. This is what, you know, we talked about because that's already being recorded in an open meeting. Yeah, yeah. I just, I because I've done it. I've talked to chairs mm -hmm. to ask them. You've talked to chairs? Uh, yeah, the ones you sit in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> well, it's, we're getting even goofier than we are. Usually. So uh, any, any further uh, discussion before we um, uh, move to the next um, matter, which doesn't seem to be anything? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I um, declare this meeting adjourned. All right. Thank Good you job. very much, guys. It is. As long and tiring as it is, it's always a pleasure to hear the question. We should probably it's good. Every February. <laughs>